at the minute, um, we're pages 5 to 13. And if members are content that they're accurate, then I'll sign them accordingly. Great. Some matters arising. Uh, item one for matters arising is some additional information that's been provided by uh, Laura Lee uh, from the International Union of Sex Workers. Uh, during the oral evidence session on the 9th of January, uh, Laura Lee indicated she would provide more details about the number of members in the union and how many members are from Northern Ireland. And uh, she's provided that information indicating it's a small, closed organisation of 10 individuals none of whom are based in Northern Ireland. The relevant correspondence is at pages 15 to 17 of your meeting folder. Chairman, um, it did strike me as a bit odd that if she only has 10 members, she had a difficulty recount, recalling that. And I think we also need to place into context the strength of her evidence, given the fact that it's such a small and non-representative body. Um, we're really talking about an organisation which also, as she admitted the other day, has got those who would be, I suppose, called pimps as part of the membership. So really, we're talking about evidence which, in my opinion, doesn't have a great deal of validity. Okay, well, it's, it's there for now. Mr. Dix. With regards to that matter, on their website, um, they, and I've quoted this on a number of occasions, they cite that the International Union of Sex Workers is part of a well-known trade union, that's the GMB trade union. Would it be appropriate, given the information which we've now received, to write to GMB and ask them that they believe their connection and association is with the trade union, so we can get that directly from their general secretary? Yeah. Happy to do that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, item two, under okay. matters arising, there's a joint letter uh, from the Minister of Justice and Lord Morrow regarding um, the bill. Um, they have been engaging on the content of the Human Trafficking Bill and to assist our consideration of legislation, they've set out where some progress has been made and the clauses on which they have reached agreement, uh, some of which will require amendments and areas on which they have not been able to agree. So the letters on pages 3 to 7 of the table pack, it's there at this stage for members noting obviously it will assist us when it comes to uh, clause by clause consideration and we'll be able to make reference to it. But Certainly, I welcome the engagement that uh, the Minister and, and Lord Morrow have been able to have on this and to reach some agreement on some of the areas, so uh, that's been helpful. Um, item three of matters arising is research into prostitution in Northern Ireland. Um, written evidence submission on human trafficking bill the Department undertook to provide further details of research into prostitution in Northern Ireland that's being commissioned by the Minister. Uh, a paper has now been provided outlining aims and objectives of the research and is advising tenders will be advertised within the next few weeks. The Department has indicated that further detail on, specific, uh, on the specification for the research can be provided once tenders have been published, and the relevant papers are 8 to 12 of the tabled pack. Okay. So that information is there for members noting. Item 4 uh, of matters arising, uh, members will note uh, page 13 of the table, fa uh, table pack, uh, there was a complaint uh, that has been uh, brought to the committee's attention following questioning of Laura Lee at last week's evidence session, and it's there for members' uh, information. Item 5 is the Magistrate Court Rules uh, Northern Ireland Fine Default Procedure. Pages 18 to 21 of the meeting folder of the relevant, has the relevant papers. On the 9th of January, we noted correspondence from the Minister advising accelerated passage bill to deal with the issue of enforcement of fines is no longer required, as a lawful enforcement procedure can be implemented through court rules, and that the Magistrates Courts Rules Committee has developed and agreed court rules to create a procedure for allowing fine default hearings to be held. The Minister has now provided some further detail of what the new rules will cover, and they are also referred to in the Court Rules Full Book Programme for January to April of this year, which is at Agenda Item 11. Given that Magistrate Court Rules are currently not subject to any Assembly procedure, it will therefore not come before the Committee to scrutinise, and the Court Rules Forward Work Programme does not provide any further detail, then the Committee may wish to request further information on the proposed rules. Is it something that members would want to pursue, or are we content to, to leave it with the information that's now been provided? 
Otherwise, we'll we'll note the information. Okay, noted. Item four is the agenda today is from Northern Ireland Judicial Appointments process and uh, the High Court competition um, that we uh, discussed with uh, Judge Marlin. So we have oral evidence uh, today from the Judicial Appointments Ombudsman, and um, they'd like to come forward. <coughs> Relevant papers for members are on pages 24. Uh, to 229 of your meeting folder. A further paper has been circulated today and that can be found on pages 15 to 22 of the table pack. So if I can formally welcome the Northern Ireland Judicial Appointments Ombudsman to the meeting today. Um, as before, now you're accustomed to, to these proceedings, it'll be recorded by Hansard and published in due course. Um, just to advise the Ombudsman that uh, policy relating to judicial appointments and complaints processes um, does fall within the remit of the Justice Committee, and we do have legislative powers obviously in this area. Um, the Committee um, is seeking to clearly understand the process adopted in the High Court judge case uh, brought to its attention to increase the understanding of how NIJAC operates and then to inform our consideration of judicial appointments processes and any changes that may be required. And it was given the gravity of what the committee has heard in relation to this competition uh, that we believe there's a need to look at it in the, the wider public interest within the context that I've outlined. And hopefully you as Ombudsman will be able to assist us um, in our deliberations of the matter. Um, you had indicated that you would be constrained um, in, in some respects as to what you would be able to tell us. Um, so obviously uh, you'll be able to advise us throughout the meeting if there are areas that you're, you're unable to, to assist us with. So uh, in your opening remarks, I would appreciate if you're able to at this point identify where you believe, I think it was section 9i that you refer to um, within the uh, Justice Act of 2002. It may preclude you from information if you're able to indicate <coughs> what areas do you believe that's applicable to. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, okay. I could cover those points, actually. Okay, well, um, I'll hand over uh, to you. Thanks very much. Um, I've got some written points, so I'll um, try and run through those as quickly as I can. Uh, thank you for inviting me to give evidence following the earlier session last year, which you've held in relation to a civic competition for a judicial role. I'll try and be as succinct as possible in these opening comments. This particular judicial competition was initiated in 2009, during a period before policing and justice matters were devolved to the Assembly. My understanding is that the legislative framework does not provide you with a remit to consider these particular issues or the details of my investigation and individual complaints or to compel me to give evidence or to provide any documentation to you. Uh, I have responded to your invitation by attending on a voluntary basis because I recognise this committee has a legitimate interest in the administration of justice in Northern Ireland, of which judicial appointments are a part. As an independent office holder, I am neither there to represent complainants <coughs> nor the Judicial Appointments Commission, but required to undertake impartial investigations and make decisions. I was appointed as the first judicial Northern Ireland Judicial Appointments Ombudsman in September 2006. My appointment concludes in September 2016, or before, depending on when this role is subsumed into the new, as yet to be created, Public Services Ombudsman role. I report on my activity and costs each year through an annual report which was laid in the Westminster Parliament up to 2010, and since the devolution of Policing and Justice Committee issues is now laid in the Assembly. These annual reports are published on my website at www.nijar.gov.uk. The Justice Northern Ireland Act 2002 sets out the framework for investigating complaints from candidates. These complaints cannot relate to an individual not being appointed, but should be about the process only. I am required to set out my findings and decisions in my reports. A draft report should be sent to the Commission and Lord Chancellor for any comments, and I should include any comments received from them, as well as my response in the final report. The legislation make, makes clear that the report sent to the complainant should not include details about any other candidate. It has always been my practice to send the same version of my <coughs> final reports to the complainant, the Commission and the Lord Chancellor. 
In the case of post-devolution <coughs> complaints, the legislation provides that the draft report would go to the Office of the First Minister, Deputy First Minister, instead of the Lord Chancellor. The legislation also states no information relating to judicial appointments and discipline must be disclosed without lawful authority and is confidential if it relates to an identifiable individual. This does not prevent the disclosure of information which is already available to the public or the courts following legal proceedings or as a result of a court order. This duty of confidentiality as required by legislation is not unique to my Ombudsman role. I assume this committee is aware that the Northern Ireland Ombudsman has similar duties of confidentiality in relation to his individual cases which are set out in the legislation governing his role as do Ombudsmen in other jurisdictions beyond Northern Ireland. I would not wish this committee to have the mistaken impression that there is nothing in the public <coughs> about any of the complaints I have dealt with. It is important to promote public confidence by striking an appropriate balance between transparency and confidentiality. I have tried to do this in each of my annual reports by providing an anonymous summary of the complaints so that confidentiality of complainants and others is respected as well as complying with the statutory framework. These summaries also include the three sets of complaints made by one individual about the same competition that were referred to in the evidence considered by this committee in an earlier session last year. I've drawn your attention to these summaries uh, in my earlier correspondence, and in total they make up 17 pages of the three annual reports in question. Even though maladministration is not defined in the legislation, I am required to make a judgment in each complaint about whether or not it has occurred after considering if any unfairness in the appointment process has been identified. My personal interpretation of this term would be identifying a systems or process factor which is of such significance that it effectively makes the entire selection process null and void. In these sets, three sets of complaints, I have held four out of 26 complaints and decided that none of these four constituted maladministration for the reasons set out in the summaries of my final reports. I have always met with complainants at the beginning of my investigations in order to <coughs> listen to what they consider <coughs> to be the important issues, as well as explaining my role and the process which I will adopt. I make it clear that my role as Ombudsman is not to review or substitute for any decisions taken in relation to individual candidates during or at the conclusion of a selection process by the Commission. I have then agreed the terms of reference for my investigation with complainants. After this, I obtain access to all the documentation relating to that specific competition from the Commission before deciding whether any further interviews should be undertaken or additional material needs to be collected. An important consideration is to ensure fairness to complainants whilst respecting the confidentiality of other candidates, and I make judgments about this during the course of investigation. I do not regard this process as being an adversarial one between the complainant and those complained against, or for me to be guided by one or more of the parties in how I should discharge my responsibilities or indeed to act as an advocate on behalf of one particular party. I have read the evidence given in a previous session to this committee and note there appear to be some selective quotations from one or more of my final reports. I am not able to place my three final reports into this series of complaints or indeed those relating to any other complaints in the public domain. As an Ombudsman, my starting point has to be a consideration of the statutory framework and my obligations to comply with it as an independent office holder. It is my understanding that the committee has been provided with copies of my final reports and background material from another source. It is a matter for this committee alone to consider whether or not this material should be put into the public domain and what the implications of this might be. The committee will no doubt be aware that for the purpose of this legislation it cannot regard itself as the public. I note from the oral evidence previously given to this committee that there has been a conflation of the issues <coughs> relating to this specific judicial competition with suggestions being made for changes in the future governance 
of judicial appointments processes. I have not addressed this second issue at length in my opening comments to this committee because I see them as two separate matters. I have written to you previously drawing attention to my first annual report, which was published in 2007, summarising the discussions that I had with over 60 opinion leaders, largely drawn from Northern Ireland, about themes such as judicial appointments, complaints processes and diversity. I have also arranged for each member of this committee to receive a copy of that particular annual report, which is also available on my website. Finally, I hope I can be helpful to the committee in its deliberations about judicial appointments processes. Thank you very much. And hopefully, um, as we ask questions, you will obviously be able to judge for yourself if that's yep. something that you're able to address. Um, certainly, your assistance is appreciated in, in the way in which we want to, to look at this, which at the outset I did indicate um, is because we do have a role when it comes to NIJAC. Um, we did, we did have a review, mm -hmm. and we will be having another review. Um, and so this is to help inform us so that we know what type of yep. um, organisation we think is best to, to serve the needs of our population. This particular case, I believe, will give us some insight into the broader workings of NIJAC, which at the point of that review mm -hmm. we weren't aware of, but now we are. So there, there is a, a broader principle here I'm not particularly interested in, in finding guilt or innocence on the part of this individual who's been the complainant, but if it helps make the point for highlight areas that are of concern as to the, the broader operational workings of NIJAC, then that's something to, the, to this committee, and we've taken legal advice on this. We are uh, in, a, in a sound place to be doing. Right. Well, all I'd simply say is, Chairman, I'm mean, absolutely on the same page in terms of where you're trying to get to. I think I'd simply make the point that clearly, if I feel that there are constraints from the statute, then I'll clearly signal that to you. But I wouldn't wish you, or indeed members of the committee, to feel that I'm not trying to assist you, because I, I hope I've made it clear in my opening comments. I think that you, as a committee, have clearly got the role in terms of focusing on the administration of justice, and judicial appointments are a part of that. I don't think there's any, any um, misunderstanding between us about that issue. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Well, let, let me start with a couple of questions, um, and relates to a 2007-08 report. You indicated there, um, let me quote, when considering whether maladministration has occurred, your role is to determine whether the process for assessing the complainant's application ensured, ensured that he was treated fairly. Now, you, f you find in that report the selection panel had failed to discharge its duty and complete the moderation process, yet you concluded that the complainant was not disadvantaged and maladministration had not occurred. Can you explain how you reached I that I think conclusion? what I'll, I'll do, I think, is quote what I said in my annual report. I think that would be the appropriate thing, because I don't think it's mm -hmm. appropriate to go beyond that, actually. So you'll have to bear with me if I can try and quickly... Um, uh, <coughs> page 10 of my kind of annual report for uh, 2009 to 2010. And I will write to you subsequently to your secretariat to, to kind of draw this out. If I may, with your permission, Chairman, I, I said that the issues raised have been summarised as follows. The Commission, through its actions of its selection committee, had treated the complaint unfairly without observing due and proper process, and that this was not remedied by the Complaints Committee. The selection committee's approach to moderation was flawed, the justifications for its conclusions were inconsistent, and there was the appearance of bias because of the decisions that were taken by the committee. The selection committee should not have introduced a second round of assessment, the format of which was unfair. Members of the selection committee should have recused themselves after the first round of interviews. The complaints committee had not subjected the decisions made by the selection committee to rigorous and searching scrutiny. Now, these were the... In a summary, these were the first set of complaints. I've set out at page 10, 11, 12 and 13 my findings on each aspect of those complaints, and I've concluded by saying, although I've held two aspects of the complaint, and there were some specific aspects that I do not consider it is possible 
to incorporate within this public report because they relate to other candidates. I have taken the view that all these dimensions need to be considered within the totality of a selection process. I do not consider that the appointments process was flawed in relation to this particular competition. Um, in the report, you indicated uh, there's the appearance of bias, yep. and then it was changed to the perception of unfairness. Uh, that was at the request of the Lord Chief Justice. No, the, 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 role, I, the, the role that the Lord Chief Justice and the Lord Chancellor have, and this is set out in the legislation, is that they, and it's a matter for you to consider in the future, whether that should be extended to complainants. You know, that's a matter for you. Their role is to look at the committee and to actually say whether there are any further issues which they should be bringing to, to my attention. And I think that the point that was being made there... Um, oh, yes, here we are. I'll, I'll actually, with your permission, uh, if I may read this part out. One of the strands within the complaint was whether or not the conduct of the selection panel had given rise to an appearance of unfairness. This was relevant because in, in that it has provided a strong motivation behind the complaints. It was also clear from my discussion with the complainant and with members of the selection and complaints committees that there were differing perceptions and assumptions. Responding to the c concerns which emanate from a perception of possible bias Having sensitivity to appreciating the difficulty of making a complaint and considering the possible ramifications for the competition should have merited a speedy response to the complainant. The Commission should at all times take into account whether any actions or otherwise on, the part of, uh, on its part or its committees provide a continuing sense of confidence. This is about sensitivity to external perceptions and not about the intentions of individuals or groups within the Commission. For the reasons set out above, I upheld this aspect of the competition. And that's at page 12, Chairman, of uh, my annual report for April 2009 to March 2010. What, what, in what way does perception of unfairness differ from appearance of bias? Uh, my understanding, and I've thought about this, is, is that I understand that for lawyers, bias means something very clear in terms of actually uh, the procedures and the way they were followed. And my, my view on this all, all the way through, and I'm not a lawyer, not a lawyer, was always about the question of the, uh, the issue how this was perceived. Now, I'm going on what I put here. Now, you have to appreciate that what I put in my public report and I've tried to, as far as I can, take as much as I can from the final report and put it into an appropriate context. But there is material, and you will appreciate this because you as a committee have seen this, um, and I hope you understand why I felt I cannot put that into the public report. In terms of that moderation process, um, did, did you actually establish why, what, what the reason really was that they didn't complete it? Um, so they, they, they totted up, I think it was four out of five areas. The complainant obviously has indicated to this committee, had they have completed it, he would have won the competition. Well, um, But they, they stopped after counting up four of them. Did, what was the reason for that? I think I'm going to try and see how we can respond to that in, in, and try and be as helpful to you as as possible. Yeah. Um, it was clear from the documentation and my meeting with members of the selection committee that there were extended discussions about whether it was possible to complete an assessment of candidates in terms of all the competences. Sorry, that's at page 10 of the 2009 10 report. Once the selection committee had decided to introduce a further stage into the competition, the moderation process was then left in abeyance. I considered that the selection committee should have continued with its deliberations and completed moderation. I am aware of the reasons why the selection committee felt unable to do so. 
completing the moderation process would have ensured a completed audit trail for this part of the recruitment process. And the guidance is explicit that this falls within the responsibilities identified for the selection committee. Taking these issues into account, I upheld this aspect of the complaint. If I may, with your permission, read the next section. I think that's relevant to you. The committee decided to recruit, introduce a further stage in the recruitment process after consulting Commission staff. The selection committee saw this additional element as part of a continuous assessment process for the position. I noted that the Commission staff guidance to the committee is based on public, published guidance, which states that, quote, the Commission may decide at its dis dis discretion to use additional assessment methods at any stage of the selection and assessment process, for example, case studies, tests, role plays, etc. Unquote. I did not agree with the argument that it is only the <coughs> Commission as a whole which can adopt this approach at the mm -hmm. beginning of the competition. That was one of the complaints that was made. In deciding to add a further assessment stage to the appointment process, the committee did not create a fundamental flaw. I did not agree with the view that such any such action is inherently unfair to candidates when it is clear that the committee is mandated to act on behalf of the Commission and take appropriate decisions within clearly defined parameters. For these reasons, I did not uphold this aspect of the complaint. And just on this point, more generally, Chairman, I, I approach my role, uh, and, it, and it's not for me to talk about my background here, but it, as a non-lawyer and as someone who's been involved with selection from a number of different perspectives, a number of different roles, and to look at that. And you have essentially a core element of this complaint has always been that actually this process should have stopped at that point. That's been, always been a core element of this particular complaint. And it's, it's on that element of the complaint where you have said that, and this is what was in your report, the, the selection panel chaired by Lord Justice Coughlin failed to discharge its duty because it, it didn't complete the moderation process. It, I, I accept you have a subsequent paragraph you know, that they, could have, they, they, they were allowed to do this, but you found they had failed to discharge its duty that selection panel, because it didn't complete the moderation process. And then you find in the conclusion, however, the complainant wasn't disadvantaged, maladministration mal had not occurred. No. Had they have completed the moderation process, Judge Marinan would have won. So how can you then come to the view he wasn't disadvantaged no. and they failed to discharge their duty? I, I think the question here, uh, and, uh, I'm trying to think how I can kind of uh, obviously illustrate this to you. I think the issue here is that you're talking about, and the complaint may say so, is talking about one stage in the process where it's very clear that a decision was taken, that the selection process was more than that stage. I think there's a wider issue here that's also raised, wider issue may say so, about selection processes, and I, I mention it here in my first annual report, about the whole question uh, of whether selection processes should uh, be based on a formulaic approach of numbers on one aspect of the selection process, or whether actually, if you're seeking to appoint someone on the basis of uh, looking at uh, the question of merit, you're looking at the question of the self-assessment the candidates put forward, you're looking at, looking at consultee comments, which you get, you're looking at shortlisting, you're looking at the role of an interview, and whether you say that actually that one interview should be everything on which everything hinges. And I think that I'm simply just making the point that, and, I, and I'll simply just quote, if I may, with your permission, two or three sentences out of my 2007 report. 
The interview should be part of an overall selection process that is seeking demonstration of the competencies to a standard of excellence and allows the exploration of various, various issues. This evidence adds to the candidate's own self-assessment and information in the references. It may also be the case that the use of other selection techniques might be helpful. The importance of adopting a holistic approach is that it does not elevate the interview to being the ultimate arbiter in the selection process and lead to a situation where rigid formulas are adopted because of concerns about <coughs> subsequent challenges that may occur from candidates. At what point was the, the, this new stage introduced to this competition? Was it set out to the candidates at the start, this is the process, or, or I, when, when I, did they I'm afraid it? I'd have to put that in writing to you, Chairman. I mean, I'd, I'd have to go back and look at the papers on that. Well... I've tried to, you know, I've tried to kind of... I mean, again, and I'd also want to look at... want to look at... it may be in my final report. Okay, well, I'll bring in some other members at this point. Yeah. Um, Mr. McCartney. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for your candour so far, just in relation to this, because it is difficult to go between what are generalities and, and the protector in the subject, and I appreciate that. Uh, can, can I refer to you, just for, in terms of your powers, uh, in terms of Annex C of the, of the Ombudsman's docket, our document? Yeah. yeah. It, it says that you have. Uh, it says what, if any, uh, action he recommends should be taken by the Commission as a result of the complaint. Have you the power to, to say the competition should be rerun? Uh, my, hmm, that's an interesting question. I think that my definition of, of uh, maladministration would be that if it was null and void, my view would be that I would then, I would then effectively write to in terms of my final report, what I would be saying is that the entire competition should be run. Yeah. I think there's been an assumption, I may say so, there's been an assumption um, that if, for example, another candidate was not found to be appropriate in some way, that automatically this would have gone to, to the complainant. I, I, I don't want to go into the particulars no, of it at, I, at the moment. I'm just that I'll point. come to that, but I'm just, I'm just asking you: Have you the power to say to the commission the competition should be rerun? Hey, in terms of the legislation, my, my role is to make the point, is to comment on whether or not, and it comes back to nine I, and I uh, obviously I can find the section and read it out to you, but. My, my role would, in terms of defining maladministration, the way I define maladministration would be I would be saying very clearly this competition is null and void and should be rerun. Okay. So you have the powers to do that? Well, that would be my interpretation. Yeah. Well, it's not stated like that in the legislation. In that instance, what would happen if there was someone then appointed? Would they be asked to stand out of office while the competition is rerun? Well, I, I think that's a question I think the Commission would have to answer rather than me. OK. But, I mean, you can see the, the sort of particular predicament that you could put the Commission in if you decided uh, competition you know, was null and void, well, null administration you know, well, or whatever, well, but you've already, they've already appointed. Well, may I, may I kind of um, follow that one, one through uh, and, and draw your attention to something else that I actually uh, said? to the Commission. Um, and, and I hope you'll bear with me. I'll try and find this as quickly as I can. It was about, it was about a situation where um, I was commented on the Commission arriving at a decision, uh, and I think that is important. I think that... Uh, um, you, you, uh, remember, you criticised me, Jack, for continuing with this competition whilst your investigation and the complaint was ongoing. Well, uh, l let me read out to you what I said. I think it's for you to decide whether that's criticism or otherwise. I, I, uh, I said I, I... This is at page 19 in my report, uh, again, annual report 2010-2011. I note that there is no formal agreement between my role as Ombudsman and the Commission whether the appointment process should continue whilst I'm still considering a complaint. This is responding to particular points that you're in. In this particular competition, 
the Commission had decided to make a formal recommendation to the Lord Chancellor before I had issued my final report. I am mindful that the Commission is an independent statutory body, and I am also aware I have no power to substitute my own decision in any selection process. I consider that such decisions taken in the midst of a complaints process can give rise to the perception on the part of complainants and others that the complaint is being viewed as of little value or there are closed minds with regard to the outcome. Confidence in the integrity of the selection process can only be a casualty of such perceptions. I recommend that the Commission gives consideration to adopting a general policy that no formal part of the appointment process to fill a post will be made unless any outstanding complaints process relating to the same competition has been completed. Now, what I meant by no formal part was really that no recommendation really ought to be going to the Lord Chancellor or anywhere else, obviously until the complaints process, you know, whatever deliberations the Commission may have behind closed doors in terms of its own discussions, it clearly ought not to be taking that step. Because at the end of the day, and, and I think, again, if I may, just coming back to your point, I think if you think about the role of Ombudsman, Ombudsmen do not have a role to actually say, you must do this, you must do that. I think you have to appreciate the Ombudsman essentially is, is setting out, undertaking an impartial investigation and making recommendations. Well, I would hope, as an Ombudsman, that actually whatever I say would be listened to very carefully and, very, and treated seriously. But I accept that there will be occasions when my reports and my conclusions will not necessarily be welcomed with open arms. Yeah, I, I, but in, in broad terms, I mean, NIJAC is, is a body which you know, we, and I say we collectively, uh, must have confidence in that their process of selection is beyond reproach. In, in this instance, I think the role of the Ombudsman is to, is to ensure that uh, if a person makes a complaint, then it will be listened to, adhered to, and acted upon. So, if, and I would agree with you, you know, if, if, if someone makes a complaint which is upheld, and subsequently upheld, but the competition runs ahead, then you can see why the public, or people, I mean, not, you can't speak for everyone, but you can see why, well, what's the point of making a complaint? They just continue on the competition, and then nothing happens at the end of it. Uh, can I come to the part where you submit the first draft or a draft and you give it to the Commission? Uh, when they ask for corrections, which they obviously do, and you know, sometimes it's accuracy, but in this particular instance it's, it, it's phraseology, what's a process which makes you or allows you that, that you will change your first held opinion? Mm. Well, simply. The only process is to actually look at what has been sent to me in writing, uh, and I'd like to assure this committee that simply because people write to me on a first name basis, that doesn't pay any part of my thinking or how I approach that. Uh, so I look at I look at the points that are made, and I put those points down in my draft report, and I put down my response to it. But at the end of the day, I think it as part of the issue of confidence. And if I'm sending the same report to the complainant, the, law, uh, the Lord Chancellor and the Commission, everyone sees what I've received, everyone receives what, I, sees what I've considered, and everyone sees the view I've taken on it. So that's, that's the, the actual uh, way that, that I, I approach that uh, very clearly. Now, uh, again, I'm... If it's helpful to the committee, I'm very happy to try and find it and, and quote um, to you what I've actually said in my uh, annual report on this. Oh, right, yes. Um, um, sorry, let me just... Uh, I think I'm going to have to try and, again, say I'll come back and send you a, a short note on that specific, okay. specific point. Uh, um, uh, yeah. Now, could you give us some insight? You know, and I know it's, yeah, it's yeah. obviously now you have to reflect mm -hmm. on our hindsight. Mm -hmm. You know, w what, what, what would you have to hear or what would have to be relayed to you 
to change your opinion that something is the appearance of bias to the perception of unfairness. Um, can you explain what the difference between them two phrases are, even in, in general terms? Well, uh, I'm going to try and see if I can find... Um, Oh, right. Um, I don't know if this is the point you're talking about, but I think... Oh, yes, I think it, it is the point that um, I talk about. Um, yeah. The complainant had been informed that the Commission had met and had taken decisions which included recommencing the competition be before a new selection committee. If you'll recall, there was a discussion about what recommencing meant, uh, etc. In his view, this had direct implications for his application, as well as constituting unfairness which amounted to maladministration. Sorry, this is page 9, the annual report, 2011 to 2012. The Lord Chief Justice, brackets in his capacity as the Commission's chairman, referred to the reasons why the Commission had adopted this course of action <clears throat> and also confirmed that the implications for the complainant had also been discussed before a final decision was taken. My initial view was that this aspect of the complaint could constitute maladministration because the complaint, complainant had not received any feedback formally about the application as part of this competition. The Commission responded to my draft findings brackets as it's entitled to do within the statutory framework, close brackets, by drawing my attention to its feedback policy and also pointed out that the complainant had been offered feedback shortly after interviews had taken place, but this had been refused. In my final report, I decided that the existence of a feedback policy and the Commission's adherence to it meant that it was not appropriate to make a finding of maladministration. I recommended that the Commission review this policy in terms of its existing time limits to candidates for seeking feedback, placing the onus on candidates to actively seek feedback, and also to consider how the policy could apply to those candidates who had any grievance about the selection process and who might also wish to make a complaint. So, so I, because the uh, complainant didn't want to hear the feedback, it, it changes from uh, well, could constitute maladministration, mal then on the appearance of bias and their perception of unfairness. Yeah, but that was part of it. And yeah. the other part yeah. I've uh, made is that the fact that it actually had a feedback, it had a feedback policy, it had a, a structure. I think but, the issue but, that my role is about yeah. is not, uh, and I think what we've got to do here, my, my role here is to look at the question of what are the systems in place for dealing with the appointments process. And my issue, what I have to look at is, have those systems, have those procedures actually been adhered to, how they operate within that system? And actually, if there is any movement outside those parameters, coming to a view about the seriousness, the significance of that lack of adherence. Okay. I just want to move on because I think in terms of the feedback and the, uh, I mean, I assume that NAJAC has a, a, seer, a, a clear set of guidelines as to how to conduct uh, an interview, uh, which they have to adhere to. There's no room for, we can interpret one day this way or an hour way in an hour day. And the reason why I'm saying this is because the way myself have been involved in uh, appointments, mm. you know, and one of the things that always strike me is that you're given very, very clear guidelines mm. as to how to conduct the interview, and you're actually cautioned that if you deviate from mm. aspects of it, mm. then the competition could be declared yeah. null and void. And, and, and one of them in particular is around scoring and moderation. You're always advised in all circumstances to conclude that on the day of the interview. We have a situation here where that doesn't happen. I, I find it difficult to understand, even not uh, even allowing for that you could say, but there's another part of the competition that still not has been run. I don't think that uh, it's proper that that could be used as a way of saying, but we don't have to conclude the moderation. I can't see that in the rules. 
Yeah, I can understand it may be wrong, it may be open to scrutiny where not you can say, well, we have a uh, run the competition, but now we're going to have a, an hour aspect of it. Even that in itself, I think, is, is, is worth the scrutiny. But moderation should be completed, is the advice uh, that uh, you're given. And I think I've already quoted to you that I upheld that aspect of the complaint. I think but, I made yeah. that point in my comments to you. But having, having ruled that way, I would say, and this is my personal opinion, that in any hour circumstance, in any public appointment, a person would feel that the competition should have been rerun at that point. Well, I think the point I'm making to you, uh, but I, uh, let me put it this way, um, because I, uh, we're coming into kind of constraints territory now. Yeah. The point, the point I'd, I'd, I'd make to you is, I think I've said this very clearly, that there were four aspects of the complaints that I held. One of, this is one of those. This is one of those. And, and what I think I've said to you that, in my view, looking at the entire system, looking at the entire system, and I've also said, actually very clearly, that one of the other aspects I've held was that I think that a very powerful, all the way through, very powerful impetus for these particular sets of complaints has been the perception of a very strong sense of injustice on the part of the complainant. I think that's very clear, very clear to you in the evidence certainly very clear to me on the three occasions. And again, I'd like to make the point uh, uh, to this committee that I, I met the complaint on three occasions. And I can assure you that on each occasion, uh, they were for some hour. So I have to say that when um, the suggestion is given that they're fairly short meetings, um, I, I don't know what the definition of short is, but certainly I can assure you that I went into this matter quite exhaustively. So I'm very clear about perceptions on the part of the complainant. I'm very clear that uh, I've looked at this matter uh, and tried to be as thorough about it as possible. I think at the end of the day, um, clearly, I think you, I'd simply say, I think you have to recognise there, there can be a diversity of perceptions about how a case may be handled. Yeah. But I'd like to assure you and the committee, as far as I've done, I've, I've looked at that. But uh, just coming back to your point, that aspect was upheld as a complaint. No, 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 I accept that, but the point I'm making, people can have perceptions about what's just or unjust. Now, any person that runs in a competition or applies for a job, I'm sure, has the confidence that they feel they're appropriate account. If they don't get it, they might feel they didn't get a proper hearing. You know, whatever. But if there's clear guidelines that has to be followed, yep. right, and they're not followed, then to me that's improper. And if something's improper, then you act in the proper manner. And I would, say, and I, I say this, and I've, I mean, I've asked people who are involved in this field, mm -hmm. we would give advice to many, many groups, and they said if moderation wasn't carried out in the way instructed, then the competition would be ruled null and void. So in this instance, it's not. And then, subsequently, we find out that if it had been concluded, the person would have been seen as the, the person successful, notwithstanding that there may have been an hour stage introduced, and that's, that's at the, the gift of the Commission. Fine. But I think afterwards, when this is investigated, and you accept that, that they didn't follow the guidelines, then I can't understand why someone wouldn't say, I think that's an unfair competition and should be wrong. Well... <laughs> I think we're getting into constraints territory. I think you're making a number of assumptions. You're making a number of assumptions that actually um, a particular decision taken at that point would have resulted in a particular outcome for a particular candidate. No, no, I'm not. no and I'm not. I'm not. Well, I, no, I'm sorry. I, I, I certainly am not. I think I, what, what I've said very, very clearly is if the guidelines guiding me hmm. to do an interview said you must conclude on moderation and you don't then that is not following the guidelines. That's what I'm saying. The, That's factual. But there are assumption but, but there or a presumption. But there are other guidelines which give the committee the authority, they give the committee the authority to introduce other stages into it. And the point I, I have made, no issue about no, the hour stages. And, and, no and, issues about yeah. the hour stages. What I'm saying is that the guidelines to the Commission and to the selection panel say that you must complete moderation on the day. Whatever else 
goes on around it in terms of whether well, there's 10 more stages or there were stages the day before. That's very, very clear. It's stated in black and white. Moderation must conclude on the day. And, and it didn't. Point, and the point I've made, the point I've made uh, to you is that actually it should have been done in terms of audit trail. Yeah. It should have been done in terms of audit trail. I'd simply say that um, I'm not making... Um, I think you're making certain assumptions about what should have happened then. And I think that's a matter for the Commission to respond to. I've, I've set out very clearly that my view was that the Committee had the mandate to continue. The Committee, in not undertaking or completing that part of the process, you've made the point that you see that as a fundamental flaw in the entire process. And so did you? No. I upheld that aspect of the complaint. If it had been a fundamental flaw in the whole aspect of the complaint, that would have been maladministration. Yeah, yeah, but but you, you made the observation that that shouldn't have happened. Yeah. So, so, so in other words, they broke their own guidelines? And no, someone no, breaks I'm, I'm sorry. Look, there are four, there are out of 26 complaints. It doesn't, see, it doesn't matter. If, I, 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 I make this point. I, it doesn't matter if there's 40 complaints or one complaint. If the complaint is, is upheld that they didn't follow the guidelines, then I think you have to act. And, and in our circumstances, if it was an interview panel, if it was an interview panel for your job and you were told it wasn't followed properly, I'm sure you'd be saying, well, I didn't get a fair here. Well, like you, I noticed from the evidence that you have been a member, a lay member of employment tribunals. Like you, you know, I've in the past, for a decade, I was a lay member of employment tribunals. I was not a tribunal. I was, not just a, I was on a selection for, yeah. for jobs. Okay. And one of the clear guidelines okay. that, that we were given yeah. when we were following the procedure was scoring should be completed on the day. It shouldn't be done afterwards for obvious reasons. <coughs> because well, a person could change their mind overnight or they could be, you know, something could happen outside the room. It has to be done inside the room. That's a clear guideline. If you're given that guideline, you have to adhere to it or you're not following the procedures properly? Well, I, I, I've been involved with different sorts of selection processes. Uh, that's simply the point I'd, I'd make. I'd, what I saw here was something that should have, certainly should, should, have, should have happened. I think where I don't think we, um, are perhaps um, looking at this perhaps from slightly different perspectives, is that I think your view is that that created a situation where the whole thing should have stopped. Well, what I would say is, what's the point of having it as a guideline? Well, if you don't have to do it, why write it down? Well, I think that what I see here is I, you know, I, I see that you know, the Commission, the Commission uh, is an independent body with a remit to promote confidence in the integrity of the appointments processes for appointing judges. That's what the Commission's there for. And people have to have confidence in the way it goes about and does its business. And my role, my role, is really actually trying to assist that by dealing with when complaints are made to me. Now, in terms of this case, and indeed other cases, one of the things that comes through very clearly is that the Commission has an approach where it quite rightly makes sure that the Commissioners who are involved with running the selection competition are not the same Commissioners that deal with the complaint. So it has a different perspective. It has, you know, in this case, I think it had, from memory, it had three Commissioners who were involved with uh, sitting down, drawing up the advertisement, drawing up the job specification, working to, as you put it, the kind of general guidelines which uh, the Commission has. And also, in this particular competition, <coughs> deciding that it actually wanted to introduce that additional stage. And the reason it wanted to introduce that, my understanding of it was, from the material I've, I've seen and, and you will have seen, was that because it, it felt it was unable to come to a clear view on the candidates. So I think that in terms of it, when it came to the question of a complaint, obviously my role as Ombudsman was to very clearly go through and look at 
all the documentation that the selection committee obviously looked at and actually have it undertaken that. One of the other complaints was that the complaints committee did not look at this. And the complaints committee actually looked at this in some detail. Right? And the complaints committee uh, came to a view that actually, yes, there was guidance, yes, there was guidance, but for various reasons, various reasons, the actual marking was not concluded, but came to a view that that did not create this fundamental flaw. Now, you know, you, you, you take a different view on that, and, and, and that, of course, is your prerogative. All I can say to you is, all I can say to you is, is that obviously I've looked at this material uh, in great depth as, and, and thought about it, and, and so have you, and I've looked at it from the point of view of looking at it from the point of view of the process as a whole. I think there are some quite important broader issues, if I can come back to something the Chairman said at the beginning. Just before we get to the yeah? broader, because I'm... Yeah. <coughs> Members are asking specifics, and you're at times elaborating way beyond that. So we're trying to con constrain. Well, I'm trying to help you. Well, I appreciate session. that, but we're trying to constrain responses to the specific questions. So, okay. other members who want to ask questions, are there any other members who have want to ask questions at this stage? Can I just make this final point, that Chair? Not of me. See, the reason why, in my opinion, the guidelines are there is to ensure that we don't end up with people say, "Well, you know, maybe the day, but not tomorrow." Of course, the guidelines are there to be uh, adhered to. And, and if they're not adhered to, then I think there should be sanction. I don't think uh, there's anything more I can really okay. add to. I've, I've quoted and I've okay. set out, I think, very clearly why I came to the view I did. What would need to happen for you to find maladministration in a competition? I think what I would... Hmm. Oh, uh, I can give you an example, but it's not an example here from Northern Ireland. In addition to um, the cases that I've dealt with here in Northern Ireland, I've, I've been appointed on about a dozen occasions uh, to be a temporary ombudsman in England and Wales when the ombudsman over there has had some kind of conflict of interest. Um, and, I've, and I had uh, one case that it wasn't a... Because over there, the Ombudsman deals with judicial conduct as well as appointments. Um, and um, I haven't got the annual report here with me, so I can't quote the thing off my hand, so I'll just have to do it very briefly. It, it was a judicial conduct matter, and it was a matter where um, the individual uh, came before a panel. Um, and what happened was that uh, the material that had been sent to the individual concerned focused on certain issues, certain issues, but actually when the individual came before the panel, other issues uh, were dealt with, were actually put in front. So the, so the individual was um, basically being asked a question about matters about which that individual had not had any prior attention. Now that was absolutely unfairness. You know, absolute unfairness. And my recommendation there to the Lord Chancellor, and it also went to the Lord Chief Justice for England and Wales, in the draft report, was that actually that panel, and this was not commenting on the substance or otherwise of those issues, was that actually that panel uh, should actually be ruled null and void, and actually that a fresh panel with a fresh set of people to be reconstituted. Now, in that case, uh, and that happened last year, the Lord Chancellor and the Lord Chief Justice agreed with my draft view, so my, the, the final report, which went to uh, the complainant in that case, uh, was that uh, the Lord Chief Justice and the Lord Chancellor agreed with my view that that was maladministration, and they agreed that uh, a fresh panel should be reconstituted and the individual concerned should have advance notice of, of, of you know, I hope that that's helpful yep. to give you. So, you know, unfairness which permeates the entire process. Mm -hmm. I, I suppose it's, I'm trying to understand this grasp when you keep saying you looked at the entire system. Whenever I think to myself, here was the competition, here was a moderation yep. process, yep. it counted four out of five, 
Then they stopped and at that point decided, we're going to add a new stage into this because it wasn't before. Yeah. It was at that point there was a new stage. Yeah. And what you have found is they were wrong in terms of failing to complete the moderation process and to, yeah. to have that properly audited. Yeah. But you've looked at it in the round, however, because no. the system allows them to have a second stage, even though the second stage no, no. is introduced at a peculiar point, no, no, then that means it's not maladministration. No, 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 Chairman, Chairman no, 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 let, let's, let's, let's just unpack that a little bit. What happened here was that the selection committee uh, clearly uh, met, clearly met, and obviously, as part of those discussions, they clearly came to a view, and it's not, for, you know, I'm not here to, to comment on this question of whether candidate A or candidate B should, be, should have been appointed. That's not what this process is about. Yeah. What happened clearly here was that as part of that discussion, part of that discussion, the committee came to a view, you know, and it's their view, came to a view that it was unlikely that they were going to have a clear cut differentiation. I, I, I know where there are issues here about this question of numbers, mm. right? But that committee came to that view, right? Now, if there had been nothing in the guidance which had, which had said that you can, you can actually introduce a fresh stage, there was nothing in the guidance, clearly that would have been absolutely unfair. Absolutely unfair. But they had the remit to be able to do that. Now, what they didn't do, right, what they didn't do was actually complete the scoring. Now, if they had completed the scoring, if they had completed the scoring, that still doesn't mean they didn't have the remit to go on and have another stage. So I think, you know, I, I, I think we've got to be clear here about, you know, actually, what is it we're, we're actually saying here? I think what, what, what we're saying is that the, com the committee did not, that selection committee, did not complete that particular part of the selection process. <coughs> Mr. McGillis. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you very much for coming. It's been very useful. Um, we're looking at this, and, and uh, colleagues are very right to say we're not trying to rerun this competition. We're not, you know, we, we can't determine who was right or wrong here. Um, but uh, in terms of, of the individual candidates, but um, it, it would be fair to say that. Uh, both candidates were suitable for appointment. I don't think that's for me to say. I, uh, can I just make another f yes, point sure, on this, if I may? Sure. Uh, I think one of the issues here, and this is again a matter for the, for the, for the Commission, and it, you know, it may or may not be a matter for you, for you to think about. I think the Commission, um, and if I may, all of you will be aware of the review of criminal justice. And, and it's quite interesting. If I can just quote in my, this is my first time you report. The Review for <coughs> Criminal Justice said the recommendations envisaged that a body would enhance public confidence by, promote, promote it, by providing an approach process that was, quote, transparent and responsive to society's needs on the one hand, but on the other must be clearly seen to be insulated from political influence. Full stop. Now, you know, clearly there is an issue there. There are all sorts of issues about the relationship uh, between a body like the Commission and yourselves. Mm. There's a question about clearly uh, how a body like that might be constituted. There's certainly, I think, a question, uh, and one could look back at this case, for example, it's not for me to say, mm. but one might ask the question, one might ask the question, in fact, I have said this somewhere here, um, and I'll quote, another feature of this particular competition is that there were a small, this is page 19 of my annual report, 2010-2011. Another feature of this particular competition is that there were a small number of candidates. In addition to considering whether or not there is sufficiently large pool of candidates to interview within any competition, uh, sufficiently large pool of candidates to interview within any competition, the Commission also needs to consider its general duty to promote diversity. I recommend the Commission introduces a commitment to satisfy itself that there is a sufficient pool of candidates in any competition and that general duty in respect of diversity has also been taken into account. Mm -hmm. Because I think there are some 
I mean, I, I know that the risk of being told off by the chairman, but there are broader issues as well as this, this individual case. I, you know, I think the thing for me is that if one looks at these complaints, all three sets of complaints, the fundamental issue here has been that there's candidate A and candidate B, mm -hmm. and if candidate A, uh, for whatever reason, is ruled out of the process, candidate B ought to have been appointed. You know, I, I'm paraphrasing, but, but that's a very strong element in the way the complaints have been put. Yes. I think that, you know, the question it raises is the broader question, actually, is for a competition of this seniority, of this importance, this is important in the context of, of um, uh, you know, the administration of justice in Northern Ireland. The question is, actually, you know, there's a broader question here about looking at the pool of candidates, looking at actually the size of uh, the number of candidates that you get, etc. And I think that um, it, it for, for, and I simply make this as someone who, uh, again, has been involved in selection from a lot of processes. Uh, I personally have not been involved in many processes where there are simply uh, two people at, at that sort of level. Yes, although they were shortlisted, that's my understanding. I think there were other uh, applicants, but uh, nonetheless, you're not making any comment on merit uh, in relation to no. either. I don't think it's my place. Actually. Either candidates. That's, that's your, your basic point, and I understand the point about a larger pool and all the rest. But we're we're we're, uh, we're at the point where there were two candidates, and that's that's the, the situation we're in. Um, but. Uh, perhaps a broader issue is this. Uh, you made certain recommendations to the um, uh, to the Commission, um, and one of those recommendations was in relation to um, adopt a general policy that no formal part of the appointments process to fill a post will be made unless any outstanding complaints process relating to the same competition has been completed. Mm. Uh, and now that was your recommendation in your report, and I think that was March uh, 2012. But uh, the point I'm making is the recommendations that you make to the Commission, are they binding on the Commission, or has the Commission got an option? whether or not to accept uh, that recommendation. I think, as with other ombudsmen, my recommendations are not binding. Therefore, you know, they're, they're, they are there for the Commission to consider and take into account. Uh, and this is common, you know, not just to, to my role as ombudsman. I think if you look at other ombudsman jurisdictions, you. you'll, you'll see the same. I think, I think the issue here is that you know, I, I, I have to work on the basis of that the people will look at what I've got to say, what I've got to say, and will actually treat it seriously. Yes. Now, what this means for me is that I have to, in turn, look at the issues I'm considering, look at them thoroughly, and actually put forward what I hope are clear uh, and persuasive reasons why I think those recommendations should be taken. Now, I would also hope that those who consider those recommendations, uh, in particular public bodies, independent public bodies, and particularly an extremely important independent public body in, in our constitutional architecture, uh, would actually seriously consider and take on board what I say. Uh, were you... Um uh, did you find it unusual that uh, the Commission proceeded with uh, its recommendation to make a recommendation despite the fact that the complaints process had not been exhausted? Well, I was very surprised, and, and I was obviously surprised, and, and that's why I felt I should comment on this in my report, and I also felt I should make a formal recommendation to the Commission. That's very helpful. Um, now, the, uh, the Commission had recommended a candidate, and then, and that was on the 28th of uh, October 2009, and uh, then on the 8th of March uh, 2010, there was an interview uh, by 
uh, the Lord Chief Justice stroke uh, chair of the commission of that candidate. Um, now, uh, would you regard yep. uh, you, you, you made comment okay. on that? And, and, and would it help that you and the committee, if I just quote that? Yes, indeed, yes, yeah. that would be yeah, very absolutely. helpful. Yes, yes. Again, it's page 19 in my annual yes. report, 2010-2011. Uh, One aspect of the complaint has touched on the differing responsibilities which the Lord Chief Justice has in his capacity as Chairman of the Commission and as Head of the Judiciary. It is possible that the exercise of these two roles may give confusion on the part of others, although not by him. Uh, and I say that because I discussed it with him. I note that a recent competition for other judicial posts, which was undertaken by the Commission, has resulted in the interviews with successful candidates being undertaken by another senior member of the judiciary rather than the Lord Chief Justice in his role as the judiciary. So that was uh, clearly... Um, the point that I made there. Now, if I, I know that I've actually commented on this, another part of the report. Yes, yes, I've been Ten seconds to try and yes, yes. try and find <coughs> this. Um, um, uh, this was about this. The, 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 the complaint was about the fact that uh, another another candidate had been seen. So I need to kind of just uh, try and. Uh, um, find, um, oh, right, yeah. Uh, as part of my investigation, this is in my annual report 2011 to March 2012, and it's page 8. As part of my investigation uh, into these complaints, I studied the documentation. Oh, right, no, no, this is... Uh, I beg your pardon, I'm reading the bit. Um, I may have to kind of come back to it, but well, well, while you're asking the question, may I kind of try and, not without being rude, but yes. try and listen to you and try and find yes, that well, page? Well, uh, and, uh, I, yeah? uh, just leading on from that... Um, there clearly is a problem in a situation where... Oh, sorry, may I yes, with you? I've ahead, just yeah. found it, mm -hmm. just found it, so we can, we can do that. Yep. Um, Get the camera. Yep. The complainant... Um, um, yep. The complainant had also... This is page 13 on, uh, for my annual report of April 2010-2011. The complainant had also um, noted that the Lord Chief Justice had in interviewed the other candidate and felt there was no provision for this within the rules of the competition. The Lord Chief Justice had confirmed to me that he had interviewed the other candidate in his capacity as head of the judiciary, which he said was a normal practice for candidates who had been recommended for appointment to judicial office and also that officials in his private office had been involved. Uh, during my discussions uh, with an individual commissioner, um, oh right, no, sorry, I ignored that bit. The next paragraph, I noted that the meeting between the other candidate and the Lord Chief Justice had occurred because it was normal practice for him, as head of the judiciary, to meet those recommended for judicial appointment. Sorry, this is page 14. No? Yes. I also noted that the process of decision making. Uh, uh, right, sorry, uh, this is going on to the way that they, they were having the, 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 their meeting. Uh, I, yeah, I upheld the aspect of the complaint raising the issue of inappropriate involvement by persons outside the appointment process, but did not consider this had resulted in a fundamental flaw in the competition for this particular role. Um, I did not uphold the aspect of the complaint that the additional interview with the Lord Chief Justice had resulted in unfairness to the complainant because it was an interview that would normally be held with a candidate who had been recommended for judicial appointment. Yes, but uh, the, the point I'm making is obviously that was a problem for the complainant uh, and, and was rightly brought to your attention. The point I'm making in relation to this is the confusion or the uh, coincidence of roles, mm. the Lord Chief Justice and the Chair of the Commission at the same time, 
give rise to this problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in such circumstances, I think you recommended that instead of the Lord Chief Justice, if there was a conflict, uh, and then uh, some other member of the judiciary should do the interviewing. I think that's what you said. Um, uh, would, would you be off the view uh, that uh, this um, uh, conflict between being Lord Chief Justice and Chair of the Commission is, is, is something that should be uh, looked at? I, I think, I think, as a committee, I think that because I, again, I've, I've looked at the evidence that's been given. I think, as a committee, you've got three models you could look at. Uh, I mean, sorry, before that, before the structural models, I think there are three, three elements. I think you have to look at. One is, I think that an independent judicial appointments commission, I think, inevitably has to have some judicial members on it. You know, in a sense, if you think of sector people with appropriate skills and knowledge about the judicial process. Clearly, I think another group, another group, I think, will be uh, perhaps representatives of the legal profession, because obviously you will have people who um, uh, aspire to be judges and who come from the legal profession. And then I think a third group, clearly, are people who are neither judges, neither lawyers, because actually, and I'm sure this is something that um, uh, it's something I've certainly written about and I've thought about. I think the appointment of judges is not a matter that should be left to judges and lawyers. Mm -hmm. It's a matter which actually the wider public clearly should have an interest in, in terms of the administration of justice. And that's where it seems to me that you as a committee have clearly got a very important and legitimate interest. Now, those are the principles. Yes. Those are the principles. Now, if you look at actually England uh, and Wales uh, and, and Scotland and here, in England and Wales, you've got the Judicial Appointments Commission with 15 members, which has five judges who are nominated by Judges' Council. Mm -hmm. You have two uh, lawyers who respond to public advertisement, one solicitor, one barrister. And then you have the remaining members, uh, of which, if my maths are right, five are lay people who respond to uh, 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 advertisement, and the chair who is actually a lay person. Yes. And then you also have two further members who are lay people, one of whom was a lay magistrate and one of whom is a lay tribunal member. That's the model in England and Wales. Mm -hmm. In Scotland, you have a judicial appointments board composed of ten people, five of whom are lawyers and five of whom are non-lawyers. And they respond to, uh, as I understand it, to advertisement and uh, I think the lawyers, or some of them, actually come through representing their professional bodies. In other words, they, they are nominated. Now here, in Northern Ireland, we have 13 commissioners, if you count the, 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 ch the chairman. You have uh, the chairman, who happens to be the Lord Chief Justice, uh, and who also nominates, as I understand it, certainly as I've written in 2007, and I'm not aware of the situation changing since then, but the five judges on the commission are nominated by the Lord Chief Justice. You have the two legal members who are nominated by the respective professional bodies, and then you have, that's five, seven, and then you have the five remaining lay members who respond to public advertisement. So there you've got three different models. Now, I think what's important to all three, and, and you were kind enough, if I may say so, uh, to kind of quote me when I last appeared before, when I mm. talked about that, you know, surely the, the, the raison d'etre for having judicial appointments commission is uh, that actually they should be emphasising their independence and actually should be seen as independent bodies. I think it seems to me that, that one of the questions that you as a committee would, ought to be thinking about is really... Um, what structures would best actually enhance public confidence in uh, the process for appointing the judiciary, recognising that you've got to have some element of judges involved, you've got to have some element from the legal profession, and you've clearly also got to have uh, some element of the lay profession, and also, if I may say to you, in reminding you that actually it's also got to be within a context 
but it has to be seen to be insulated from political influence. Yes. In the words of the Review of Administration of uh, can, uh, uh, th Thank you for that. Uh, can I just move on very quickly? Uh, you did advert to persons outside the yeah. uh, selection process being in contact or doing things mm -hmm. in relation to uh, this process. Mm -hmm. Um, is that is was that did, did that did you find that unusual? Well, uh, my view is it was an administrative. It was a, uh, let me assure the committee it was nothing to do with the selection process. It was an administrative task in terms of um, uh, writing a letter. My view is that if you have an independent public body like the Appointments Commission then all the processes, including correspondence, etc., should be undertaken by officials in that, in that organisation. Mm -hmm. And I think, that, um, I think that, you know, when you have a situation where you perhaps have an individual with the two roles, you know, this, I'm, I certainly don't take the view that this one aspect, because a particular letter was, was written, that this is an argument for saying, there should be a separation within that. I think what you have to do is to look at this in, in, in the round. Now, my view there was that clearly uh, that was a complaint, and obviously there was a factual basis to it, because clearly the, what had happened here was that the letter, the letter had been sent to the other candidate inviting the candidate to come in. Yes. But it had gone from, shall we say, perhaps... The, the wrong office. I mean, the person may be going in uh, well, well, to see the Lord Chief in his capacity as head of judiciary, but actually it is, in my view, still linked to the selection process. Well, you, you saw that as improper, but not um, uh, fatal to the... No, I didn't. Yeah. I didn't no. uh, but uh, the, there was a letter written to, uh, my understanding, Detti and the FSA. Is, is that, was that an unusual thing? Uh, I, I, I'm afraid I, I, um, I certainly can't comment on that. That's to do with you're raising issues to do with another candidate. Yes. Yeah. You can't comment on that. Um, and then, in relation to, um, uh, can I ask you, in relation to the withdrawal of a recommendation to the Lord Chancellor, Nijak seeking to withdraw a recommendation to the Lord Chancellor, is that an unusual thing to happen? Um, I'm not sure that's one of the complaints. I don't think that was put in that but, way. But whether it was a complaint or not, well, I mean, did you, did you regard that as... Well, a... if, it's not, um, if it's not part of the complaint, uh, it's clearly not part of our remit. The point I'm making. Yeah. You know, because if you look at the legislation, I don't have power to to pick up points, pick up points by myself. What I have to do is to listen to uh, what's being said. I think what you're talking about, if I may say so, is. Yes. Um, let me try and find a way I can answer that, where I've kind of picked up something analogous to it. Um, Um, one of the issues I raised, one of the issues I raised with the Commission was that it seemed to me, I mean, there were all sorts of concerns which the complainant raised about the lack of information that was provided. The, commission, the complainant was concerned about um, lack of transparency. Uh, the complainant was also concerned about um, the delay in communicating uh, with him. Yes. And the commission also, and the complainant also was concerned. I mean, I'm paraphrasing here, but the com complainant was also concerned. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, paragraph nine. Yeah, and this is where the, the, my initial view of the maladministration aspect have come from. This is annual report, April 2011 to March 2012, page nine. Um, the the. The complainant had been informed that the Commission had met and taken, taken decisions which included recommencing the competition before a new selection committee. Mm -hmm. right. In his view, this had direct implications for his application 
as well as constituted, constituting unfairness which amounted to maladministration. The Lord Chief Justice, in his, oh, I've, I think I've read this out before actually, in his capacity as a commission, commission chairman, referred to the reasons why the Commission had adopted this course of action and also confirmed that the implications for the complainant had also been discussed before a final decision was taken. My initial view was that this aspect of the complaint could constitute the management because the complainant had not received any feedback formally about the application as part of this competition. Uh, as part of this competition. And then we had the issue about the feedback policy. Um, because I, you know, I, I, I've read all the correspondence to do this case, and indeed I, I suspect you probably got all the comp material as well, and, and I'm sure it would take you a fair bit of time if you sat down and started to go through it. Um, I don't think I can kind of... Um, I can go any further than that, just simply to say that, that, that clearly... Um, um, Oh, yes. Um, the, the, the complainant had also, this is page 10, same, same annual report, the complainant had also raised the issue of not being provided with material which I have seen. I, I did not consider there had been any maladministration for the complainant in terms of non-disclosure. Now, this is, let me say, this is about material relating to the complainant. Yes. Um, there were lots of requests. Uh, to have information about other candidates. Um, and, and the reasons which we've discussed, uh, I think you will now understand why the Commission and I uh, didn't provide that information. However, I accepted that there may be concerns on the part of the complainant in this regard. I suggested, uh, and this is part of my recommendation to the Commission, that the Commission may wish to give further consideration to whether it felt able to disclose this material in a redacted form, and specifically where it related to the complainant's application and the decision to recommence the application. In other words, clearly um, the, the Commission uh, met regularly as a group. They clearly discussed this on a number of occasions. They clearly had minutes and, and a record of those discussions. And of course, those discussions took, didn't just consider the position of the, of, the, of the complainant, they clearly consider the position of other people. Uh, obviously, it comes back to this question of where do you look at this in terms of um, uh, confidentiality and transparency, and it's striking an appropriate balance. And I did make the suggestion that perhaps a redacted form of some of that material might at least, at least help uh, the complainant in understanding. Yeah. Chair, one last question. Um, uh, the, uh, <coughs> the Commission decided uh, to recommence, mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, they, they, they did so after, let me see now. Not sure of the date, but anyway, they decided to recommence the uh, competition. Um, now, that was after the Lord Chancellor had given his opinion in relation to the other candidate, um, and that was accepted by the Commission. Um, so that left one candidate, namely the complainant, in the pool as it were, uh, and at that point the Commission decided to recommence uh, the competition. Um, was that not a very, very unusual thing for the Commission to decide to do? I, I don't think that's part of our remit. I may have a view. Yes. I may have a view, but I don't think it's appropriate to, to give that view here. I mean, I may have a view whether that... I think the, the, the issue here is... The issue here is, it seems to me, if I was looking at this from an outside as a layperson, not, yes. as, not as the ombudsman, mm -hmm. is actually that, that it seems to me that if you want to promote as much confidence in a process as possible, I think that you try and be as transparent as you can within the situation you've got, and I think you try and be as timely as you can. Yes. Uh, 
And, and I'm not saying this making a criticism of, of, of anyone in the Commission. And there may be quite legitimate reasons for why the time scale stretched to the time it did. Uh, but there's no doubt in my mind, and I can say this on the basis of having met the complainant on three occasions, there's no doubt in my mind that, that you know, this whole process, and the complainant made this very clear to me uh, each time I met him, that it actually has taken its toll of, of, of him as an individual. Yes. You know, from the, from the very point at which he made the complaint. Because actually, uh, in this area, in this area, I think when individuals make complaints, you know, clearly, I think that they uh, do have the perception that this is, uh, shall we say, it's not necessarily going to be, what can one say, from their perspective, um, a, a, an action which uh, they would take lightly. And I think that if you then have a process which takes a considerable period of time, I think for them as people, I think it can have quite a, uh, a difficult position here. And I think that, um, you know, I'm, I'm satisfied that in administrative terms, you know, the Commission met on a, whole, on a series of occasions and they clearly uh, considered this in some detail. Uh, the other side of this is that they took their time, they spent a lot of time on it, but it clearly had implications for that individual. Uh, and I think that, you know, you will have seen um, that I did seek to get an understanding as to what the word recommence meant. Yes. And the word recommence, effectively, was saying that this competition is coming to an end and we are actually starting a new and fresh competition. Uh, uh, I, I take your, your point about... Um I want to comment on, on that decision itself, but is it not pertinent to the uh, complaint that was made by the complainant that there was a recommencement instead of a conclusion to the uh, uh, competition? I think that one of the things you saw, what you saw in this particular complaint was that there was a considerable exchange throughout the whole process of correspondence between the Commission and the complainant's legal representatives. Yes. You had a considerable exchange of correspondence. Yes. And I think that what you had was that... Oh, yes, I mean, that's right, sorry. <coughs> uh, and if I may just go back to this. Um, uh, it may I just, just quote this, because I think it is relevant to what I've just said. In addition to meeting business need, and what I was really saying Perhaps here... Perhaps you could quote the page. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just page 19. Up. Page 19 in my annual report, 2010 to 2011. Uh, I note that Northern Ireland has a relatively small legal and juri judicial jurisdiction so that any delay in com appointments can potentially have a considerable impact on court business and confidence in the administration of justice can also be affected by the passage of time. In addition to meeting business need... I suggest that timeliness in, in completion of the process should be an aspect of, of excellence in any selection process. With these issues in mind, I recommend that the Commission seeks to complete competitions without undue delay and also make it clear to candidates in its competition literature that any timescale should be regarded as being indicative only, because there may be reasons why there is some, some delay. But I, I think that one of the other issues that we were talking about. But could it just stop in relation to delay? I mean, yeah. the, that was really the decision to recommence, I think, was around about June of 2011. Yes, it is, yeah. And uh, the new appointment didn't take place until the 8th of April 2013, arising well, out of that process. I know there were other High Court judges appointed, but arising out of that process and arising out of the recommencement uh, a new, the, the new High Court judge appointed as, as, as a result of that recommencement wasn't sworn in until the 8th of April 2013. I do understand that the new judge had um, other duties in relation to an inquiry that was ongoing but it doesn't seem to be any great um, 
uh, hurry in terms of that particular mm. appointment, despite the point that's been made about mm. timescale mm. and delay? Uh, the only point I'd make is that that was clearly a, a, a different competition. Uh, I didn't receive any complaints about that competition, and therefore, clearly, it wasn't part of my remit. But yes, no, I understand that, yes. Um, but I think that I'm, I'm just trying to, again, pick up the point that you uh, just alluded to, and again, with your permission, because I did um, try and... Um, Uh, oh, yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, there was this point about the differences of view about what was going on in this correspondence. And, and, and clearly, part of this was there were letters clearly being exchanged about possible legal proceedings, etc. They were clearly sort of very much part of this. Yeah, um, page 10 of... Uh, my annual report 2011-2012. Another aspect of the complaint was that the Commission's decision was ultra-virus because of its unfairness and irrationality. I mean, this is quoting <coughs> letters from... Mm -hmm. and as a lawyer, you, you'll yeah. appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, um, from, from, from the complaint's lawyers to the Commission. And this constituted further evidence of the appearance of bias for its competition. Uh, the Commission had taken the view that the course of action adopted by it was permissible and not precluded by its statutory obligations. Uh, this is an issue on which there are differing legal interpretations. Uh, I mean, that was very evident from the correspondence. I took into account the considerable exchange of correspondence between the Commission and the complainants, solicitors and other documentation. Uh, I did not consider there had been maladministration in terms of the Commission's decision-making or the appearance of bias through its competition. Because what, what was happening here was that the complainant solicitors were saying, what has happened here is bias. What the commissions, uh, and presumably after advice from its lawyers, were saying, no, this is not the case for this, this and this reason. Mm -hmm. Now, what didn't happen here then was that you had two different sets of uh, differing legal interpretations. And what didn't happen then was that, uh, that this wasn't tested in a court situation. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we know that, and I think uh, Judge Marnon gave his explanation in relation to that. But it, it does seem extraordinary that, having spent so much time, that the Commission, at that point, uh, decided to effectively abandon the process of appointment and to recommence. It seems quite an extraordinary decision. I'm not a Commissioner. I'm not part of the Commission. Uh, but uh, it seems to me that what we should be thinking about here is selection processes which are actually uh, meet the business need. And the business need here is to ensure that the process is undertaken as efficiently and as timely as possible. And also, I think, in a way that's receptive to candidates and, and uh, indeed, I think, uh, is also, I think, sensitive to candidate perceptions. Because at the end of the day, I think what's really important is that actually, you know, judicial appointments are critical to, in my view, are critical to any democratic society if you are going to have confidence in the administration of justice. What do I mean by that? I think what's essential in the administration of justice is the concept of equal treatment. Everyone who comes to the courts wants to see uh, a judiciary that, uh, I've thought, that is appointed on merit, a judiciary that actually is sensitive and responsive uh, to that. But I think that what's important is that uh, the processes are actually appointing the judiciary have got to be, I think, clearly as transparent as possible, as is possible, in the, in the context of a selection process, which, ref which respects the confidentiality of the candidates who are participating in that. Whether or not they are complainants, but the, but the confidentiality of all candidates. <coughs> and actually that is robust and is thorough, 
and if there are any concerns, that they are investigated as thoroughly and as impartially as possible. And I think what's also critical to the confidence issue is the timeliness. I think that's important, absolutely. I think timeliness is uh, a critical factor in uh, raising confidence on the part of candidates. And I've, I'm not just talking here about judicial appointments. I would have thought in any appointments process that's important. I'm not, in, in saying those comments, uh, I don't think uh, uh, I have a remit here to comment on the reasons uh, why it took so long for the Commission. I don't think that's, that's part of my remit. I've made the general point and I've made the recommendation that I think that if the Commission is to learn from this and think about other appointments competition, it must think about timeliness. Thank you, Chair. And having said all of that, do you think the public can have confidence that for this competition that you upheld a series of complaints about, they failed to complete their moderation, the Lord Chief Justice's office was involved when it shouldn't have been, you upheld that, that uh, they recommenced the competition, which in effect you have said was ultimately abandoning and restarting anew, mm -hmm. and it took almost four years to complete, that the public can have confidence that for this competition, it was carried out in a way that the public can say, I believe that was an appropriate way to do things. I'm confident that NIJAC have acted with the utmost integrity and, and we now have the right well, outcome. All, all I can do, Chair, is uh, point to... Uh, I, I have looked at this particular case. I've come to a view on it. And what I have tried to do is to promote confidence in the way I've arrived at decisions. I certainly don't expect as Ombudsman that everyone agrees with my decisions. I certainly don't expect as Ombudsman that, and particularly, particularly I think that, um, for example, in a case like this where there was, um, uh, shall we say, a, a view that was taken, and I did not agree with that view, that I should provide all the material which I've got uh, to uh, uh, the complainant's representatives, because I didn't think that was appropriate. I think at the end of the day, uh, I, have, I would always try to ensure that there is as much confidence as possible in individual cases. And the way I believe the legislation allows me to do that is to try and put into the public domain as much material as I feel I can. And in this particular set of cases, I put 17 pages into the public domain. Okay. All right, well, can I thank you very much for coming thank to the you. committee? Uh, I appreciate you you've done so voluntarily, um, and I acknowledge that. And uh, I want to thank you for doing that because it is an area that we are having to consider, um, and we're trying to do our best in that. And that's why we're. We've obviously invited other people to come to the committee, and I hope that they show the same willingness that you have provided, um, because they have an insight that I believe would be very helpful for this committee. So um, I appreciate you coming and making yourself available. Well, thank you, Chairman, and, th and, th and thank, you. Uh, thank the committee. You, you are, uh, from my perspective, is that you're a very important committee. As members, you have a democratic mandate. You clearly uh, have a legitimate interest in the administration of justice. And and I believe judicial appointments uh, are an important part of that. And whether or not you have a legal, uh, an appropriate remit to, to ask me the question, I'd be happy to come at any time if you extend that invitation. Thank you. OK, members, um, let's move on. The next item, um, which is evidence around the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Bill, and the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission are with us, um, and if they would like to come to the table at this stage, we would appreciate that. Um, the bill and the memorandum can be found at tab one of your bill folder. The written evidence of the Commission is at pages 231 to 248. So let me welcome... Um, Formerly, Dr. David Russell, Deputy Director, and Leanne Cochran, who is a researcher from the Human Rights Commission. You're both very welcome to the committee. Um, thank you for taking the time to, to come to us. Again, 
It'll be recorded by Hans Hard and then it will be published in due course. So I'll invite you to make some opening comments and then members, I'm sure, will have some questions. So I'll hand over to yourselves. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, to begin, I'd like to say that the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission welcomes and is grateful for this opportunity to provide evidence to the committee. The Commission does so pursuant to its statutory duty <coughs> under Section 69.4 of the Northern Ireland Act to advise the Assembly whether a bill is compatible with human rights. The Commission has, as you will know, provided written advice to the Committee with regard to relevant <coughs> obligations contained within international human rights treaties that have been ratified by the United Kingdom. In addition, we have directed the Committee to a number of soft law standards on the matter of human trafficking that may be of strong persuasive value in your deliberations. In advance of the bill being introduced to the Assembly, the Commission also provided advice to Lord Morrow. And let me say that the Commission is generally wel welcoming of the proposed legislation to the extent that its purpose is to protect some of the most vulnerable members of our society. Moreover, it appears to do so by attempting to harmonise existing domestic laws and increase the level of protection for victims. To assist the Committee, then, I would like to highlight some of the issues contained within the Commission's submission, rather than go through it verbatim. And first of all, on the issue of human trafficking, and then secondly, on the paying for the sexual services of a person. We're taking human trafficking first, the Commission notes that the proposed sentencing of those prosecuted for trafficking offences is a minimum of two years. But importantly, Clause 4 provides for judicial discretion. This removes any risk of a blanket approach, which would have run counter to human rights law and the requirement for proportionate sanctions and consideration of cases on an individual basis. On a related matter, however, the Commission advises that there is a need for the Bill to recognise the difference between adult and child offenders. In accordance with the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, those under the age of 18 years old must be assured lesser culpability and any sanction should be premised upon the evolving capacity of the child and a recognition that imprisonment should be a measure of last resort. With regard to victims, Clause 8 suggests that they will not be prosecuted if they have committed a criminal act as a direct consequence of trafficking. The Commission advises that should, this indeed should be a strong presumption. However, victims of criminal offences, including those committed by persons who have been trafficked, are required under human rights law to be guaranteed an effective remedy. There is a tension, therefore, in this proposal that we would suggest is scrutinised by the Committee. The Commission would advise, at the very least, any suggestion of blanket immunity for offenders be removed. And Clause 8, which seeks to establish a child trafficking guardian, the Commission notes that the Council of Europe group of experts has stated that a system of guardianship is essential to ensure child's protection and rehabilitation, assisting in severing links with traffickers and minimise the risk of children going missing. Speaking in the context of the United Kingdom as a whole, the group of experts has also noted that a social worker or a voluntary advocate falls short of providing a legal guardian who can act independently and with authority and uphold the child's best interest. The Commission advises that the Committee should scrutinise the current provision for unaccompanied children and examine in particular if the critical independence aspect of the guardianship rule is being met. Turning then to paying for the sexual services of a person, and more specifically the subject of prostitution. The Commission's advice is that the criminalisation of this activity is neither required nor prohibited by international human rights treaties. However, the Commission would like to remind the Committee that the protection of vulnerable persons should be a matter of priority when addressing the question of what might be a reasonable and proportionate interference with the rights of others. For example, the extent to which the right to private life may be interfered with by the Bill must be considered in light of the duty upon the State to protect those who are forced into prostitution. In this regard, as members may already be aware, the UN Committee for the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women welcomed in 2012 the criminalisation of paying for prostitution in Norway. This law is not dissimilar to what is being proposed in the current Bill. Crucially, the UN also advised on the need to study the effects of the new Norwegian law 
and therefore the Commission welcomes the inclusion of a similar requirement to monitor impact in Clause 66 of the current Bill. One matter that is of serious concern to the Commission within the current draft is that it does not extend criminalisation to include paying for the sexual services of a child. There may be a view that this issue is already addressed through the law in the Sexual Offences Northern Ireland Order 2008, Article 37. However, the Commission is advising today that the current legislation concerning children is, in our view, inadequate. It is an offence to pay for the sexual services of a child between the ages of 13 and 18 if the purchaser does not reasonably believe that the child is 18 or over. It is currently for the prosecution to prove that the pur purchaser does not reasonably believe that the child is 18 or over. And it is therefore the case that the prosecution must prove beyond reasonable doubt that the purchaser did not reasonably believe that the child was over 18. Last July, the UN CEDAW Committee recommended to the UK Government that it revise its legislation by shifting the burden of proof from the prosecution to the purchaser of sexual services. The Commission advises the Committee that if Clause 6 of the Bill is implemented in its current form, it will be easier to penalise persons who pay for sex with adults than persons who pay for sex with children. Children must be protected in the Commission's view by the provisions of the Bill. Finally, the Commission advises the Committee that the United Kingdom will be examined on the fulfilment of its obligations under the optional protocol on the Convention on the Rights of the Child, on the sale of children, child prostitution and child pornography in June of this year. The Bill provides a timely opportunity and will no, no, no doubt be considered by the United Nations with regard to how Northern Ireland is moving forward to protect its children. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, timely that you're here in, in respect that we did get a letter from both Lord Morrow and um, the Minister in respect of the, the minimum custodial sentences applying to children. And there will be an amendment now to make sure that that isn't the case. So um, there's been some developments on that particular issue that I'm sure the Commission would welcome. Um, Mr. Wales, uh, just I'm trying to tell you, are you in favour of Clause Six or are you not? <laughs> well, you see the dance around it. You said it, it, it's not necessary. It's not necessary, but it couldn't be prevented. You're you're the guardians of human rights. Do you believe it's right for anybody to have the right to buy sexual services from an adult or a child? And I'm going to dance around it slightly again, but I'll do my best well, why to answer dancing, it directly. Why, as the Human Rights Commission, are you dancing around it well, at all? the commission, the commission will only premise its advice on what's available in the international treaties. So I was clear in the, in the off that there's no requirement in international law either to criminalise or not criminalise the purchasing of, of sex from, from, from an adult. There is clearly in the inst instance of children. However, what the Commission is saying, we recognise that one of the primary driving purposes of this bill is to protect vulnerable people. And we look to other international examples as to what has happened in other countries, most notably I'd cited the case of Norway, where international committees like CEDAW have actually welcomed, welcomed the criminalisation of purchasing of, of sex. So there's no human right one way or the other, but in principle the protection of vulnerable people is welcomed and therefore the Commission's view is that that being the priority of the bill, we welcome its thrust. You do support Trossics? Sorry? You do support Clause 6 then? We think the principle of Clause 6, yes, is, is welcome. Right. As you know, that since you, you made your submission, the, the Government at Westminster have introduced a slavery, a draft modern slavery bill. Now, for all sorts of reasons, that has major implications for Lord Morrow's bill. And uh, you said in your submission you recommend that Clause 1 should be amended to, to reflect the international definition of traffic in human beings. Now, if the definition that appears in the draft modern slavery bill is transposed into Lord Morrow's bill, what would your view then be? Do you have the definition in the draft modern slavery bill? I haven't got it before me yet, but I'm advised that there is a definition in it. Is it the definition, do you know, of the international standards? I don't know until you've got that up for you. 
We haven't considered it yet because it doesn't apply to Northern Ireland. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a reasonable response given the fact that this has come very late in the day for us. Um, it would be interesting if you'd have a look at that and see if that changes uh, your mm. submission on clause one uh, at a later stage. Because uh, my next questions are also on the, uh, the same bill uh, has a different um, definition of trafficking. Uh, and again, presumably you haven't had a chance to, to see whether you would have made your submission on that either. No, what I would say about it is um, the, the ex uh, let's assume that it does reflect the international standard and that it's brought into force in Northern Ireland and captured within the current bill. Well, then the Commission would, of course, welcome it. Um, what the international treaty bodies have called for is the harmonisation of domestic legislation with the international standard. Um, the, the top end of the bill is obviously quite complex around definition because it's filling in a number of pieces of legislation that are already in place. So if the answer to your question when we go back to it is it, for example, reflects the EU trafficking directive, well then, yes, the Commission would be in favour of it. Um, I thought you might have alluded to this in your presentation, but you haven't. Um, the Department of Justice, you know, who have been lukewarm about this bill from the word go, let's be honest about it, um, and some parties in this assembly have opposed clause four. Uh, it, it sets a minimum sentence, mm. uh, and they believe that that would fetter judicial discretion. Um, could you tell us why you believe that clause four is presently worded? would uphold the ability of judges to apply proportionate sentences, as well as keeping within human rights standards. Um, yeah, if, if I could just comment on Clause 4. Clause 4, we do have, we have written quite extensively, given our extensive advice in our written submission on Clause 4. For us, the fact that um, Clause 4 contains an exception, that allows for judicial discretion, and in light of that, we felt that Clause 4, we didn't take an objection to it other than the fact that it didn't um, explicitly articulate the different culpability of children. So, so as worded, you're content it does meet international human rights standards, close for It allows for a reflection of the severity of the offence, and that, as we said in the opening statement, that allows for judicial discretion because there's exceptional circumstances written in to clause four. Right. Our only concern with clause four actually is the fact that um, it doesn't distinguish between children as offenders and adults. Obviously, the vast majority of submissions on this legislation have been in Clause 6. And indeed, at the last hearing a week ago, we had three hours of evidence and not one line of it was anything but Clause 6. Uh, and clearly that is the, the <coughs> issue. But I seem to, to get from your submission that you don't see anything inherent in the banning of the purchase of sexual services uh, from a prostitute. Uh, or, or let's assume it's adults in this case. You don't see anything in that which contravenes any international human rights convention? So quite to the contrary. If it wasn't clear from the off, well, I've tried to say it now, but to the extent that the purposes of that clause and the bill as a whole is to protect vulnerable people, including those who have been forced into prostitution, the question is, is it reasonable and proportionate, therefore, for the state to criminalise that activity? Mm -hmm. And in the Commission's view, protecting vulnerable people has to be the priority. We're talking about trafficked persons here, women and girls, who are extremely vulnerable, and that should be the priority. So our, our general position is that we welcome Clause 6. Right. What if a person isn't vulnerable or trafficked? We had a, a representative of the International Union of Sex Workers here last week, and she said, no, she's perfectly well, happy to sell her services. So therefore, how does that fall into your uh, definition? Well, that may well be, but the question is, is it, is it reasonable and proportionate for the state in order to protect the rights of the most vulnerable members of society to restrict the rights of others? And in the Commission's view, those who are vulnerable should be the priority in this instance. Right. And I would agree with you on that. Uh, but you, you mentioned earlier the, this, the right to private, uh, private life. You don't see any conflict there. Someone may argue, well, I have a right to exercise my, to exercise my right as a, uh, uh, my private life to buy the services of a prostitute, particularly as <coughs> a vulnerable person. That doesn't impinge that particular right under the it certain, uh, Convention. It certainly interferes with the right to private life. There's no denying that. But the question is, is it reasonable and proportionate to do so? And in the Commission's view, it would be reasonable and proportionate to do so, given the gravity of, of the offences that are being committed against vulnerable people. Okay, we'll make come back later on, Mr Chairman, but that's fine. 
Ms McCorley. Um, Gurren Mayagra Carly, thank you, Chair, and, and thanks for the presentation. Um, it's just to um, we <coughs> ask you to um, talk a bit more about um, the impact on children and um, these would be matters of grave concern. So, what, what further measures do you think need to be taken to safeguard um, the rights of, of children? Um, well, there's two issues really. First of all, there's Article 37 of the Sexual Offences Order, which David alluded to, and that's that the burden of proof on the prosecution, I'll just reiterate it, for paying for the sexual services of a child is criminalised, but if the child is over 13 and under 18, the prosecution must first prove that the purchaser did not reasonably believe the child was over 18. Mm. That's a very high burden of proof, and indeed the CEDAW committee called that into question and actually asked that the burden of proof would be shifted, so it would be become a defence that the, the defendant would have to, to prove the purchaser. Um, so that's the first issue. The second issue is that if Lord Morrow's bill passes in its current form, you'll actually create a circumstance where it's easier to prosecute purchasers of sex with adults, because there's no mens rea, if you like, attached to that provision than it is to prosecute the purchase of sex with children over 13 and under 18, because first of all, the prosecution must prove that high threshold, so that would have to be amended um, if the bill goes forward. Do you believe that could be easily done, to find a form of words that would, would pr provide that safeguard? It was quite interesting in the initial consultation by Lord Morrow on the draft bill, it, it applied to everyone. It's only since it, when it was introduced to the Assembly that the bill was then moved to apply only to those over the age of 18. So certainly the, the original draft went some way towards addressing the issue. Um, there, is, there is some complexity around it in that the same issue around the burden of proof is fought, found in a number of pieces of, of legislation, but we don't see any difficulty with drafting the current legislation in order to shift the burden of proof. I'm not a legislative drafter, but I'm assuming some clause introduced would be simple enough to draft. I mean, we're not talking about statutory rape or anything like that. We're talking about child prostitution, and the international standards are very clear. There's a Council of Europe convention in regard to criminalising uh, prostitution of children. But obviously, those laws that do criminalise it, which we do have, also have to be effective. And that's really what's been called into question. The, the other thing which I said in the opening statement as well is this bill is extremely timely. The United Kingdom will be examined for the first time on the optional protocol on child prostitution. Um, and a proactive measure like this to protect children in the jurisdiction would be favourably looked upon by the UN in the Commission's view. And no doubt the United Nations Committee will want to consider the issue given that this is in passage at the moment. Okay. Thank you. See the issue around Clause 8, um, around the immunity aspect of it, just elaborate a little bit more on, on the issues there that you know, Lord Morrow's bill currently would be if you're uh, a victim of prostitution or the, 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 sorry, the individual selling the services would be immune from prosecution. Can you elaborate more on, on the Human Rights Commission's thinking? in terms of the position that you've taken on it? Clause 8 is, it, it deals directly with um, a person who has been trafficked having immunity from prosecution if they commit a criminal offence that's directly associated to the trafficking offence. Um, looking at the international standards, we can see a strong, the best way I could put it, a strong persuasive value as to why you would want to do that, given the vulnerability of trafficked persons. But the Commission is extremely mindful that what's being talked about here is, regardless of whether someone has been trafficked or not, there is another victim as a result of the criminal offence that has been committed. And they also have rights, including the right to an effective remedy. And whilst there may be a desire on behalf of the, the Assembly to allow for a clause that would have that strong persuasive value, given the vulnerability of trafficked victims, as a direct consequence, of trafficking, who knows what sort of offence may be committed. It could be anything from uh, theft 
to potentially murder. Mm -hmm. And as drafted currently at the minute, the gravity of the offences that potentially could fall within the remit of this aren't captured in the Commission's view. So our concern is there shouldn't be a blanket immunity from prosecution for trafficked victims, but we should recognise their vulnerability and that they may be forced into committing certain criminal offences. But, but certainly there should be a mind to protect the victims of whatever those criminal offences may be as well. So there's, there's merit in, in trying to find something in legislation that recognises the benefits of the non-prosecution of the victim, if a, a form of words can be found. The non-prosecution of the offender, mm -hmm. and if the offender was a trafficked person yeah. and that the criminal offence was a direct consequence of them being trafficked. But like I say, that needs to be balanced against the right to an effective remedy to have whoever the victim of that crime that the person has committed would be. Okay. Any other members? Chair, sure, I, <coughs> so I feel not very point. I was going to yeah. try and come in, and it was quite a, quite interesting analysis of, of that, David. And um, just uh, as it's drafted at the moment, it appears to give uh, what I would be concerned about is it being abused by people who, you know, um, I suppose indicated that they were being trafficked, but maybe not being trafficked. Do you see any any difficulties with that? I think you re you've raised a hypothetical scenario, but it's not lo a lot different from the one that I have just raised in terms of the different types of offences. Um, yeah. I guess, and we haven't looked at it in any detail, it would be interesting to know, for example, what the Public Prosecution Service's view might be of something like this. There should be a degree of discretion afforded to the Public Prosecution Service with regards to which criminal offences they pursue and which ones that they don't pursue. And there's certainly in the Commission's view, I can only really repeat what I've said already, the concept of blanket immunity for trafficked victims from, be from being prosecuted for criminal offences is, is a matter of concern to us. Anything that suggests blanket approaches generally raises a human rights flag, in this instance for the victims of the criminal offence. I think what you're saying that the general principle of, of what's maybe being suggested is okay, but it needs amended um, to ensure that it's not abused. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Any other members? No. Thank you very much for coming to the committee. Thank you. Much appreciated. Okay, members, we will move to our next evidence session, and we have oral evidence by the Joseph Browntree Foundation. So, if those members want to come forward. For members' benefit, it's pages 250 to Formally welcome uh, Frank Sudine, uh, Senior Public Affairs Manager from the JRF, and Neil Jarman, Director of the Institute of Conflict Research, to the meeting. And I hope I've got your names both correct. Yeah. Um, you're very welcome to the committee meeting. Thank you. Um, obviously, as before, it'll be recorded by Hansard, and then it'll be published in due course. And I'm going to hand over for yourselves to initially give us a, a brief outline of uh, your submission, and then members, I'm sure, will have some questions. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, we're also delighted to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, for those of you who aren't aware of the JRF, uh, we are a social policy charity with a mission to address the root causes of poverty and injustice across the United Kingdom. Um, we do that through a program of research and development. And one of the things we have been focusing on for several years now is the issue of forced labour and have been slowly amassing through a process of commissioning what I think is to date now the largest continuous programme of study into the issue in the United Kingdom. Um, our interest in Lord Morrow's bill really arises from the fact that one of the central themes of our research has been uh, what we're calling a justice gap in relation to um, issues around forced labour, um, labour exploitation, labour trafficking, uh, uh, trafficking for labour exploitation. And there have been a whole number of issues that feed into that uh, that you know, we could talk about uh, in due course. In terms of overall comments on Lord Morrow's bill, obviously it sits alongside a uh, 
uh, trafficking bill that's sort of working its way through the Scottish Parliament. And I, I heard a mention earlier of the drop on slavery bill that, that is being considered at Westminster. But we, our, our initial perceptions of it are that it, it does a number of things that we like. The first is it recognises there is a resources issue in terms of the effective sort of uh, prosecution and enforcement of existing law. It sets out the law around labour trafficking, uh, sort of mm -hmm. trafficking for labour exploitation, more clearly for agencies. Um, it extends protections to the victims of uh, trafficking for labour exploitation, the same kinds of support um, that are available to other victims of exploitation. What it doesn't do necessarily, and I think this partly sort of arises again from confusions around kind of definitions and so on, and uh, it's a kind of symptom of that, is address the, the needs for support and compensation of victims of forced labour who may not have themselves been trafficked. Um, and this is actually a common theme across all the legislation that's currently being considered across the jurisdictions at the point that we're making to all the relevant parliaments. Um, so that's kind of a top-line view. And um, obviously, Neil is one of the people we have commissioned to look in depth at the issue in Northern Ireland, and, and he can well make more detailed comments. Thank you, Frank. Um, Chairman, um, ICR were leaders of a consortium that did a piece of research looking at forced labour in Northern Ireland, which I'm, as part of the Social Transfer Programme. Um, and we're currently uh, doing, because that work was completed in 2010, we're currently doing a small review update on the issue uh, for Joseph Roundtree, which just happens to <laughs> nicely coincide with discussions in relation to, to this draft legislation. Um, as, as, as Frank had alluded to, <coughs> we've got nothing to say at this stage about Clause 6 <laughs> on, your, on your legislation. We are focusing purely on the issues related to um, forced labour. And... I think one of the benefits we see of this legislation is it does start to make those links with forced labour and human trafficking, but it also keeps, keeps them separate. And what, what we find a lot of the time is that the issue of forced labour does tend to get a bit obscured by the issue of trafficking. And whilst there is some considerable at times degree of overlap between the two issues, they are distinct. There are elements of forced labour which do not involve trafficking, and there are elements of trafficking which, which do not necessarily involve the way that we're talking about forced labour. So I think it's important to have the two issues separately there. I think in terms of the research we've been doing fairly recently, um, there, there seems to be increasing recognition in Northern Ireland amongst statutory agencies um, and, and, and organisations working on this issue that there is, there is a problem here of forced labour, that it's more of a problem perhaps than was recognised a few years ago, that it is a problem moving up towards more towards on par with sex ex exploitation through uh, trafficking for sexual exploitation, for example. So that there is an issue around the recognition. One of the things we've, in terms of the case studies, which is very difficult to identify um, for, a, for a variety of reasons, we saw in the 2010-2011 report some of the main areas were, were issues in, within the fishing industry, areas within the mushroom picking industry, and particularly with some of the, the Roma community in Northern Ireland. What we're seeing at the moment is, is some other areas high, uh, emerging, Fruit picking within the agriculture industry is being identified in some locations. Uh, Roma being employed in casual labour through things like recycling. Issues some around, somewhere around shellfish collecting in some parts of Northern Ireland. And still some ongoing issues within the fishing industry. So we're seeing some areas where there's been recurrent patterns over a number of years. Some areas where people are identifying patterns that they hadn't identified before. It doesn't mean they weren't there before, we just haven't, haven't noticed them. <coughs> there also seems to be um, an issue around cross-border issues, around particularly where perhaps where a gang master is based in one jurisdiction and the work they're bringing people <coughs> to do is in the other jurisdiction. And that creates problems for enforcement and identification. And it's one of the things that's always been identified as specific to Northern Ireland within the UK context. It's the only part of the UK which has a land border, and that does mean that it has distinctive elements when it comes to looking at issues around forced labour, which perhaps don't apply in Scotland. Uh, England and Wales. Um, 
In relation to responding, um, it, we're pleased to, to see that there is a clause, clause 7 in the legislation, which looks at, at, at effective responding and highlights issues such as training. One of the issues we've noted is perhaps a lack of awareness of the indicators of uh, forced labour that pay, maybe people are picking up on some aspects around employment mistreatment or abuse but not necessarily in a way that looks at it as forced labour or perhaps they're looking at it approaches for trafficking but not notifying because there's not a clear indication of trafficking they're not recognising the forced labour as aspect of it. Um, we also be heard that there is um, something of an intelligence gap in terms of agencies being able or willing to share information which enables the right agency to make the most effective um, response to, to the situation. Uh, and we've also identified the need for better responses to be able for cross-border cooperation, which is perhaps not within the remit of this legislation, but in terms of operationalising any legislation, in particular in relation to Clause 7, we would need to think about the, the cross-border dimension to it. Um, also, perhaps in relation to Article 16, which has the, the uh, special rapporteur, <coughs> there is perhaps a need to, for, for any rapporteur to be able to think ab about the cross-border dimension uh, in, in particular. And, and then finally, we would say that uh, in relation to the victims, um, there does appear to be a particular difficulty for victims of forced labour to be able to secure an effective response. The current employment regulations and working appealing as an individual through tribunals is particularly challenging and difficult during the time, time frame involved uh, for the lack of legal aid for, for victims of forced labour to be able to utilise that. We're aware that the Department of Justice has that item identified within its uh, uh, trafficking action plan. But we do think that the issue of, uh, that's in the bill, which has issues related to the, uh, the need to support the victims of trafficking, should be extended to include the victims of trafficking and victims of, of, of forced labour. So we'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Mr Anderson. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Frank Neil, for, for your presentation. Um, you have highlighted and identified uh, the increasing problem in, in forced labour. In Northern Ireland, on the, in your submission, you recommend that assistance support uh, measures in Clause 10 of uh, Lord Morrow's Bill should be made available uh, to all victims of forced labour, not only those who have been trafficked. <coughs> Can I ask you from your research, can you tell us what, uh, what proportion of people in forced labour in Northern Ireland uh, have not been trafficked? It's, Do you have uh, any such data or figures? It, it's, it's difficult to say. It, the, some people would fall within the definition of trafficking insofar as there may be some elements of coercion or deception in, the, in them coming here. Uh, some people uh, have perhaps moved into that area as a result <coughs> of being here legally, but then drew through to uh, being put out of work, visa problems, or la losing their visa, they've chosen to stay here and have moved into this. So, they, so there are some who would be... Um, would not fall within the, 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 the classical trafficking definition. Numbers are small, and one of the issues that there's, there's a lack of at the moment is effective data to unpack the numbers. Now, I understand the PSNI, or the Organised Time Crime Task Force, are at the moment trying to, or looking at UK-wide data to open up the Northern Ireland-wide data and to try and give us some, some details. At the moment, it's, it's, the detail is just not given. So they give the numbers of people. For example, they don't even give which industry they've been working in, so, so it, it, it's limited. So we don't have some, some information. Just can't so break it down. It, it's not there, yeah. yeah. The, the uh, assistance and support measures you talk about, um, as talked about here, how many people would you estimate would be eligible uh, for that assistance? Each and each year. Again, there are <clears throat> the way, when we, we did the piece of work in 2010, what we were finding was that people were only identifying themselves almost as victims of forced labour as they sought to leave the jurisdiction. So it, it was they would stay in a, in, a, in a working environment as long as they felt reasonably possible. At some stage, it became impractical, but because of their uh, often it was then a matter of departing. 
We've done as much as we can. We're not going to seek legal redress. We don't feel it's able to seek legal redress. And, and a few people that did, didn't get very far from it. The tribunal process was taking too long for people to, to hang around. So I'm not sure that there would necessarily be very large numbers of, of victims there. Um, but it, what it might do is, is it might enable those victims <coughs> who wanted to stay in Northern Ireland and who felt there was a possibility for effective recompense, effective uh, response to their plight, uh, which in turn might highlight the issues and encourage other people to, to become public on the, on the problem. I don't suspect it's going to be huge numbers, though. Also in relation to, to support these persons, uh, you're probably aware that immigration is reserved while in the Assembly uh, could not create uh, any right to remain. But what proportion of uh, these fixtures, again, I'm keeping asking about yep. figures here, uh, for that are, these victims of the forced labour who have not been trafficked would fall into this category of not having uh, a valid visa or, or resident permit? Again, there are. Um, we are talking small numbers, but probably it's difficult. I think in that situation, you'd probably you need say to. small numbers, what do you mean? Well, small? So, so far, the numbers identified by the Organised Crime Task Force in relation to forced labour have been fewer than 10 on an annual basis. Now, um, we're not sure how far that is a, a clear assessment of the total number of people, but we're, in terms of the system coming through to the criminal justice agencies, there's, there's small numbers. Do you have any ideas how we could assist those people, maybe, who, uh, those victims? Well, I think if, if, if they were treated in the same way as victims of trafficking, per se, rather than trying to work out whether they were victims of trafficking before that could, be, that could kick in, if, if, we, if you accepted that being victim of forced labour um, enable, uh, um, opened up the, the option for those people to be treated in the same way as a victim of, of, of trafficking, that would be with a... Um, right for levels of support, levels of ability to stay, le levels of assistance to return to their own home country if they wanted to, um, willing the ability to support the criminal justice system in terms of pursuing um, the employers or the, the gang masters, then I think that would be uh, what we'd be looking for, which is where we're saying expanding the remit to include uh, victims of trafficking and victims of forced labour. Not distinguishing, not assuming that they have to be victims of forced labour through trafficking. Can I just add something to that? Um, yeah. But on this point about support for <coughs> victims of forced labour, I mean, one of the other messages to come out of a programme of research is that forced labour sort of is at one end of a spectrum. You've also got um, sort of decent work at the other, and then there's sort of gradations of labour exploitation that kind of you know, sort of sit across that entire span. And in terms of the justice gap we alluded to earlier, one of the, 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 the problems or one of the causal factors of that is that, you know, we have a regulatory system which is very low on um, interventions in the kind of employment market. It's fairly light touch and so on. So in, in terms of thinking about how one can provide support for people who, you know, either are suffering from <coughs> extreme labour exploitation or forced labour, it's not necessarily about just thinking about the numbers that might come through a specific enforcement system, but it's also about how do you put in place the kinds of sort of measures and support that it already exist and could be strengthened to identify people who are in difficult circumstances, encouraging them to come forward, and then encouraging those people who might be who might be dealing with them, whether it's sort of NGOs, trade unions and so on, to share data and information with enforcement agencies in particularly egregious cases. So um, it, it you know, in terms of Neil's point about um, the numbers being small from a criminal uh, sort of enforcement point, yes. But then there's also this thing about how do you sort of squeeze down on the level of sort of labour exploitation, and um, there are a whole number of sort of ancillary things that you could do around that that don't necessarily then lead to a huge deluge within the criminal justice system, but would actually lead to better outcomes for the people who are suffering. Uh, could, I, could I further ask you what role you'd see for employers on? business and the commercial sector in addressing uh, the problem of forced labour? Well, I mean, absolutely. It, I think it, it's really important to understand that, you know, it's important that there be a legal response, but it goes far beyond that. It, it is businesses, it's, it's trade bodies, it's individual consumers. One of the things we are 
trying to encourage off the back of our research is for businesses to sort of look very closely at their own supply chains because <coughs> what we know is that you know, the sort of criminal cases of forced labor do kind of interact with the sort of, in inverse commas, legitimate areas of the economy in different parts of the supply chain. And it does require kind of UK businesses to sort of understand where those, where those interactions lie. And um, that's for JRF going to be a big focus over 2014 in terms of where we take the message next. I mean, we're doing a lot of work with the parliaments, but absolutely this has to be about working with businesses and trade bodies you know, using their CSR agendas where possible, trying to mobilise the public to get interested in this in similar ways to sort of the fair trade movement and so on. One, one, of, the, one of the things that I've been found out from the research is people are saying that, that some of the areas are where, if not if forced labour, but, but problematic areas of exploitation were taking place, the situation has improved for, through a number of factors and not purely through, through enforcement, but, but for example in some ways in, in the um, meat processing industry where there were some complaints raised previously, people were saying with, with direct employment of workers rather than going through an agency chain, that's led to some imp improvements. That the, the, some of the light that was shone shun on the mushroom industry and previously um, has led both the, the supermarkets and some of the larger pro providers to, to improve their tidy up their acts and improve their situation. Uh, and so there has, does seem to have been, as you start to raise the area, um, raise the issue across the production line, if you like, including purchasing areas around supermarkets, as well as within the trade union movement. We're also hearing about, as, as some of the migrant workers themselves become um, more, more established here, and their capacity to engage is, is increasing, and they're raising the issues in which, in the way that they weren't a few years ago, there's some areas the situation is improving. The problem is that there, are, there is a vulnerable core of group of people who perhaps are really are very much on the margin socially, legally and economically, that, that they're the ones that are really being squeezed on this issue. Do you see uh, maybe the issues we're talking about here with employers and businesses? Uh, and that could be in some way reflected uh, in the bill to maybe give it more strength. You see, uh, that is another. I, I'm. Yeah. I think there's, there's potential within, within the. I think um, Article Seven, in terms of how responding to the issue, it needs to be clear that it's not just a criminal justice response to that. There is a wider social social response, and there is a need to ensure that you bring in a wider range of agencies. And that's where there's issues around some of the, the bodies with responsibility for areas around employment regulation. That. It, 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 I've heard anyway that it, it, it's quite fragmentary, not very well connected, that somebody will go in because they've got responsibility for X but are not acknowledging, not looking at issues around Y and not passing information on to other agencies. And I think that's somewhere that we need to look at is how, how the different agencies link up, whether it's criminal justice and or employment regulation bodies. And that, again, I think would would bring in um, the employers. For example, business in the community were very proactive in relation to the inter integration of migrant workers from about 2003 to through, to through to about 2007. So that there is a, you know, a willingness among some sections of the business community to, to engage <coughs> with these issues. So I just uh, touch on that. Uh, I've heard uh, that uh, a consistent problem with regard uh, to the subject of forced labour is a continuum that exists between the employment conditions which are in some way exploitative and what might be called slavery. Yes. Uh, could you outline from your clearly extensive uh, experience in this area what you see as the difference between the two? Well, the le levels of explo ex there's, there's levels of exploitation that go on through, through, through across the employment spectrum, which may be through to, um, you know, from li my, relatively minor things such as not paying correct overtime rates or not paying um, holiday payments, or um, which which then can increase um, until you reach a point of. A, a legal definition of forced labour, which may include holding documents, not paying money, overcharging people for additional services like housing and the like, threats, coercion and so forth. Now, between those two poles, there is a grey area which everybody acknowledges 
is is you will cross over into a form of uh, of what's considered to be forced labour. But the exact point of that, on that spectrum that you cross from from serious exploitation into forced labour and modern slavery is, is not clearly defined and I don't think can ever be clearly defined. It depends on the, a variety of different factors kicking in within the specific context. Is there, have you any ideas how we as legislators uh, should try and tackle these uh, two issues? Well, well there, there, there are the ILO independent labour organisations indicators around forced labour which give an indication of what those are. I think what you can, you can look at, again coming back to I think clause 7, there is a need to, for, for information uh, out there, particularly within the police, to ensure that all police officers are more aware of the various factors that can be seen to be constituted in, in forced labour. Similarly, within the various agencies with, with employment responsibilities, to know, to be aware of those issues, to be looking for them. Now, <coughs> I think in the beginning of, of, of the bill, you have something of a... Of a of a definition in, in Article Clause 2 in terms of slavery offences. So I think, you know, linking those through, if only thing, uh, you know, making some reference to the ILO uh, position might be the other, the other point you could make on it. But a lot of it is down to the, the, the work or, or the capacity of those on the ground who are going to investigate uh, and, and be made aware of those to make sure they know what they're looking at and recognising that it's a, a serious offence there. I'm sorry, can I just add, add to that? And in terms of your specific point about legislation, and, and it's important to do justice to Lord Morrow's work, I mean, one of the biggest problems for enforcement agencies has been previously that a lot of the, the existing legislation is scattered across immigration law, for instance, the Coroners and Justice Act. Having a clear bill with a definition, I mean, it's always interesting, the relation between legislation and action and how that's mediated through money and resources, but just doing that does represent an advance, albeit a small one. All right, sir, finally, can I have just an overall question? Uh, what additional measures would you like to see added to the bill, maybe to strengthen the approach that we take here in Northern Ireland in relation to forced labour? Um, well, I think that we made the point in terms of the victims of traffic references where there's victims of traffic. Um, as in the first couple of um, clauses, it talks about human trafficking and slavery offences. I think I would like to see that run through human trafficking and slavery offences, run through the headlines of all of the, the offences that are there, so that it's, there's not a difference between human trafficking offences here and, and the, the forced labour or slavery offences are seen as a lesser offence, which don't merit the, the, the victims of those don't merit the same level of support. I think the, the um, Clause 7 could flag up issues such as uh, intelligence sharing, uh, as in, which is around resourcing and investigation, intelligence sharing a specific issue, highlighting the issue need to address the cross-border dimensions could be, an, could be another element that could be included within uh, or revised within it. Um, I think the cross-border element is an important dimension because of its uniqueness in, in the Northern Ireland in situation. The only other point that I would, would flag up, and, and <coughs> this wasn't included in the Joseph Roundtree submission, but is related to the, the draft modern-day slavery bill by the UK government, is that and, and you had it in a previous discussion about the um, sentencing levels. Now, under the, under the draft modern-day slavery bill, they've highlighted the importance of taking this as a very serious offence and have raised the sentences to, to a life sentence for trafficking and for uh, exploitation for the forced labour. Now, to my mind, if, if Northern Ireland has a minimum tariff of two years, there's something of a discrepancy there between the two juris jurisdictions. And I think we maybe need to reflect on if, if the UK are, or the British, English, British government in England and Wales are pushing through a law <coughs> with, with a higher level of tariff and seriousness, then it maybe needs to be considered in relation to... You would like to say? I think, I think there needs to be... Um, it needs to be recognised that this offence is a serious offence, and, and it would be, I think, an anomaly to have two very different levels of offence uh, of sentences in, in the same jurisdiction for the same sorts of offences. Uh, and just to add to that, I mean, again, going back to the actual face of the bill, um, for instance, the provisions on the rapporteur. I mean, 
JIRA, for instance, has a, a sort of equivocal attitude towards it because we think while it's useful to kind of inject political accountability at one level, you also need sort of operational coordination. And going back to the point about there being already existing pieces of legislation and regulation that are there, <coughs> and it's just about using them properly. And, and I, the term joined up government is overused, but you know, to use an example, the announcement last week from Westminster around a renewed campaign around na the national minimum wage and enforcement of the national minimum wage that very much directly intersects with this. And uh, you know, again, going back to sort of Neil's point about things like indicators and so on, it's only by sort of really pursuing these lines as much as possible, understanding how they fit together, that you a kind of get a better sense of the, the true scale of the problem, but then b you actually make a difference to it. We have we have got the beginnings of the structures to respond to some of these issues here through things like the Organised Crime Task Force and the Strategic Migration Partnership in terms of bringing people together. So I think we can build on what we've got. <coughs> okay. okay, I thank you, John Mel. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms. McCord. It's already lost. Great. <laughs> Mr. Humphrey. Uh, thanks, Chair. <coughs> uh, thank you both uh, very much for your presentation. Um, in relation to uh, Clause 6, Neil, I think I, 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 you said you were steering clear, you are staying not willing to say anything around Clause 6. Why? Um, because the presentation is based on the research that we've done, and the research that we've done has been on forced labour, um, and that, that's where we're, the JRF are coming from the basis of, of an evidence-based presentation um, and our assessment based on that. That's so it's nothing to do with the... No, no, it's not, no, no. Just, we just don't just have one, anything. Just wanted to clarify. Yeah. Right I think we've, I've read the <laughs> debates in this chamber, and there's been plenty. I think forced labour is where it needs some more light being okay. shined okay. on it. Okay. Um, you make mention of um, the, the cross-border element and, and obviously the, the weakness of the UK's position in terms of the land border with, with the Republic. Can I ask, perhaps, um, in terms of the movement of people and people being trafficked against their will, obviously, can I ask you, Frank, this report, will you be making this report um, no one and giving a copy to the Irish authority? Um, it's a really interesting question, actually. We, we've always kind of operated within the boundaries uh, mm. of the United Kingdom. Um, so it, it, it has not come up, I'm afraid, at, at the moment. But I think what we would kind of, going back to Neil's point, is in terms of the specific kind of relationship that exists here, that you know, we, the, the research is there, and the research is there to be used by mm. policymakers, officials, and we'd hope, essentially, that you would show it. So you, you would only make it available if they ask you. You won't actually proactively send a copy to, to the ministers. Um, well, I mean, I think it's it, it, we could easily do so. I mean, everything is is obviously available publicly on our website and mm. be promoted globally. I think I think because it's an issue which faces both jurisdictions, mm. and those who are being abused and trafficked, the border means nothing to them. Uh, and, and so I think I think that would be useful. Can I say that? When we did the report in 2010-2011, we looked at that issue and it, and it wasn't being identified as particularly people with, thought there was an issue there but couldn't identify it. They now seem to be able to identify some. We, I've been talking to people working in the NGO sector down in, in Dublin with, and I know they've been pushing for um, a better response from the government in terms of legislation mm. Related, mm. related to this. So this yeah. may be something we will have to yeah. have a I, I, I think that would be useful. Thank you. Thank you. So, okay. um, in terms of, <clears throat> you talked about the small numbers, Neil, and, and, and that they, you believe in be, in terms of forced labour, below 10, I think it was the figure you That's mentioned. the official figures at yeah. the moment. And that's, and that's the point. Official figures. Because this is such a um, clandestine um, industry. No one really knows, and you know the, those of us who were in, in in Stockholm in December were aware, for example, that that um, young women who were being um, um, abused and forced into prostitution, uh, who, for example, came from Romania, they were being managed from Bucharest. And so, you know, it's very difficult to, tra to trace and track that. Yep. For the for the the Stockholm and the Swedish police, 
whenever the, the, the root of the evil is in, is in Romania. Um, and, and I think that would you, basically my question is, given the nature of this the illicit uh, industry, um, would you agree with me that perhaps figures are low, they're low because there is, you know, in terms of bona fide, um, robust um, information and statistics, but in actual fact, the figures are much, much higher than those that are being talked about? So one of the things we did, uh, and I can't speak to a supposition about Northern Ireland figures specifically, but we commissioned Alistair Geddes, who's a hemianographer <coughs> at the University of Dundee, to look at, to attempt to kind of come to a reasoned conclusion roughly about the scale of the problem of uh, trafficking uh, or labour exploitation in a number of cases, and looking at the official figures, thinking about all the other sort of, sort of proxy data sources we had. And... Other people have done this before, for example, the Work and Pensions Committee in the UK Parliament and came roughly to a sort of a safe kind of level would be sort of the real the real scale of the problem might be around, um, <clears throat> or rather the official figures were probably about 10 to 15 percent of the, the real figure. So for the UK, he arrived at a figure of around 3,500 people. Um, but, you know, that comes with a lot of different caveats. But... Um, you know, we stand by the, the, the feeling, not the feeling, but the conclusion that the problem, at least across the UK as a whole, does run into the thousands. Neil, can I ask you, in relation to, we, we, we're going to hear from the Department of Justice later, but um, in terms of their draft consultation, what they say is from evidence available to them, it appears that the level of human trafficking in slavery in Northern Ireland is lower than neighbouring jurisdiction, jurisdictions. Would that, uh, in your experience of the work you having uh, just finished. Would that be your view? Um, I, I haven't looked at it in comparative terms. What I would say is that I do think it is, there is probably more of it than is currently being acknowledged and recognised, um, including <coughs> in diversity of forms. So we have started to see small numbers of children who are being trafficked into Northern Ireland, including for forced labour, which didn't really register two or three years ago as an issue. I think the more we dig, the more we acknowledge it, the more we direct people to look at it, the more of it we will recognise that it exists. I do think that, that there probably is more than we think as well because of the, uh, you know, as you open up the cross-border dimension and that people coming into Dublin can be seeing that as a route into the UK and, and, and vice versa. So I, I suspect in the same way as you know, when people first started talking about trafficking for sexual exploitation, it was almost there's none of it happening here. And as soon as we started looking at it, we recognised that it was and it was a growing problem. It's the same with, with forced with force labour. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. Mr Wells. Um, you are the only group, I think, that didn't mention Clause 6 in all of the scores of uh, groups that have contacted us. <laughs> we now. And uh, I think we're, we're well covered on that aspect of the legislation. But I just want to ask you one question. Would you not consider a, a woman who's trafficked uh, into Northern Ireland for the purpose of prostitution as someone who's being forced, forced to work? And therefore, does, does that person not fall into the category that you're concerned about? The, the Joseph Roundtree programme explicitly excluded exploitation for sexual purposes within its remit, partly because there was a lot of work being done on that, and that was, was seen as being the main focus of it. And the need, there was a need to look at, at uh, exploitation for other labour purposes other, other than that. So, yes, it is a form of labour exploitation. It's a distinctive form of labour exploitation, and Joseph Roundtree, as far as I understand, does not have an evidence base to engage with that issue. As you say, there's plenty of other people prepared to talk about it. I read your report um, uh, with particular reference to the fishing industry for, for obvious reasons. That's an issue of concern for me. And you did quote the 2008 issue, which I was involved in, and uh, these Filipino uh, workers who left Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. Now, um, they were treated dreadfully. I mean, uh, they were getting $525 a month, US dollars a month, to work in incredibly difficult conditions. They were sleeping on the boat between Christmas and New Year's Day in dreadful conditions with no heat. 
But I actually rung uh, some of those gentlemen in the Philippines, and four of them were making every effort they could to get back to Kilkeel to do exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And I asked them why, and they said, well, we accepted by your standards, that by UK standards, we were being treated very poorly, but by Filipino standards, $525 a month was an absolute fortune. Mm -hmm. And they felt that that was the only way they could earn money to sustain their families in Malena. So, you know, how does that constitute trafficking in a forced labour if they want to come back? Well, this goes back to definitions, and I think one of the, the important things about about the definition of forced labour is that maintaining someone in a situation of work where they're under threat of penalty that they did not voluntarily agree to. So it's the difference between a, a group of workers who are being underpaid and exploited, that, you know, and, and you might argue that's just a force of globalisation issue, but in, it's, it's particularly in cases where you've brought them in on a different deal and you're using their vulnerability and you're using the threat of force or withholding documents and so on to impose something that they, they haven't <coughs> signed up to. That, that is an instance of forced labour. So you, you don't actually see someone who, who wishes to come back albeit to be treated in a standard which is unacceptable in, in Northern Ireland or UK context. You don't see that as traffic and a forced labour? Well, it, it's interesting because, I, I mean, it, it could be trafficking for labour exploitation as opposed to trafficking for forced labour. I mean, and this goes back to Neil's point, which is that, you know, there is this spectrum and, and there is this enormous grey area, which is one of the reasons enforcement is, is so difficult. Yeah. And one of, one of the issues that, that often it's difficult to identify people to get them to come forward themselves is that argument you make that this money is, is better or the conditions are no worse than we would be working in another area and the money is, is better. And one of, the, one of the people working in one of the enforcement agencies here said to me, the point, different, the point is, this is the UK, and, and there's other terms and conditions and employment and laws and regulations that people have to abide by. So it, it doesn't really matter then. The fact is they are laws uh, are not being adhered to, and employment regulations are not being adhered to, and people are being exploited, even if they are apparently willing to be exploited. Um, I raised this last week, and it's worth asking. It's a, a question that does trouble me. Um, some of these people who are being trafficked are coming from dreadfully poor countries like Vietnam, Moldova, places like that, where conditions are absolutely awful. So the choice for many of these people is between absolutely appalling conditions or wretched conditions. In other words, even though they're being badly treated and trafficked in the UK, they're actually better materially than they would be back at home. And that's the sort of choices that these people are making. And we're trying to impose a sort of a, a Western white man's view of things, an Anglo-Saxon view of things, on people who, uh, by our standards, are so wretchedly poor. No matter how badly treated in the UK they are, they're still better off. How do you, how do you deal with that? I think, I think if you ask them a slightly different question about <coughs> you know, whether you would be prepared to be paid the national minimum wage, whether you were prepared to offer housing that met certain standards um, of, in terms of heat, whether you had sufficient food to, to, to live with, whether you had those conditions, you know, whether you had the choice between what Frank talked about, decent employment conditions, or whether you were prepared to work in these, which you would prefer, then I think you would probably find that they would say, I, I would prefer those. So again, it comes down to something of that continuum where the conditions in their home jurisdiction may be poor and they're prepared to some, accept something better. We should at the very least aspire to the same sorts of conditions that we would expect from everybody from a UK yeah. background. Th th there's a further dimension to that, which is one of the, the reasons Jareff got into this issue in the first place, <coughs> back to our core mission of addressing poverty and justice, was a recognition that forced labour can at the more vulnerable end of the labour market acts as a further downward drag, and, and labour exploitation can. So in terms of your question about, you know, why should we be concerned, yes, there is this issue about, you know, people's choice on autonomy, but in terms of just how we run our own society and what we think the standards are and, and the opportunities we want to make available, we have to recognise there's an interplay between a permissive attitude, um, you know, what we call the pro-employer attitude versus the pro-worker attitude, that doesn't just affect these individuals, but it would inevitably have a knock-on effect on, you know, other people born here, raised here, in terms of, of kind of what they can access mm. as well. That's a very good answer. It'll probably be quoted on the floor of the Assembly, but I thought at some stage, so that's very helpful. Uh, finally, are you saying that um, you're basically supportive of the entire bill? 
with the, with, the, with the tweakings that you have suggested that the concept you're happy with and could support? Yeah, we, we think it it, it, it it takes us further than where we are. It, it obviously doesn't do everything we wanted to do. No piece of legislation can. But since you made your submission, the government in the in, in the mainland have have published this modern slavery bill. Mm. Uh, would you have changed any of your submission to us had you been aware at the time of that, that legislation? No, the, the omissions uh, that we refer to in this bill are, are largely omissions that continue to exist within the draft modern slavery bill. And in fact, as that bill you know, appears before like, the Joint Select Committee, we're going to be making exactly the same points to them around this thing about how you extend protection to the victims of forced labour who are not necessarily victims of trafficking. And you may not be aware, in fact, we've only got it this morning, is that there have been re agreements reached between Lord Morrow and the Justice Minister on certain technical issues which has moved things forward, but that literally is hot off the press. Thank you. Um, just finally, whenever we were in Sweden, there were from the Stockholm authorities, there was an indication that increasingly people that were in forced labour, um, that have been trafficked for forced labour, were being forced to engage in the, the fruit picking and that type of activity, but then also being used when it came to the sexual exploitation. Is that anything that your work has identified, that there's this mix taking place of forced labour across a range of different activities that falls into the sexual exploitation? I, I haven't come across, nobody's raised that with me at this stage. Yeah. Not in terms of the sexual thing, but what it does allow me to say, it, it kind of goes back to our submission, is the point about whether you could use your own good offices to push for extension of the GLA's remit, because what we do have evidence of is, is you press down in one area, it kind of pops up somewhere else. So there's something about how we make sure that that agency is responsive to what is a very changing landscape. Yeah, just to pick, because the, the, that's the Gangmasters Licensing Authority, the GLA, and, and you think it, it would be both practical and beneficial if there were separate arrangements in Northern Ireland in terms of additional powers? Well, I, I think our understanding of the law is not necessarily that, that that's possible, but that what we were asking was that Lord Moreau, I think, and you all, um, in terms of, I guess, your own lobbying power and relationships with the UK government, make the point that um, you know there are a whole number of instances in industries where modern slavery is being identified, whether it's construction, hospitality, care, and catering, which the GLA just doesn't currently cover, and and. Again, trying to, to kind of make headway, that might be one. Just to follow up on that point. Yeah, yeah, can I? Thanks, Chair, for your indulgence. Uh, and it's just on that very point that you made, where a pr pressure is applied, and the problem then, you know, re reappears elsewhere. That, that is exactly why I think it would be useful for uh, your your piece of work to be given to the Irish authorities, because, you know, you're obviously talking about an intra-UK context, but. This can apply, um, obviously, if pressure is applied in your area, it can manifest itself in Dublin and vice versa. And that's why this needs to, to we are two member states within the European Union, um, and, and, and you know, the protection of, of workers um, is absolutely crucial in all of this. And so, you know, what we don't want to be, yeah. quite frankly, is the soft underbelly mm. uh, in terms of, of this issue. Uh, if, if, um, for example, the, the Republic brings in legislation which, which is uh, more, more stringent and, and tougher than ours, yes. uh, or, or vice versa. That. So we, we need to really, I think, uh, tighten up on that particular issue. Thanks. OK. Can I thank you both very much for coming to the so committee? Much. It's been very helpful for us, so okay. thank you very much. Okay. Okay, members, we will keep going. The next item on the agenda is a draft consultation document from departmental officials. This is a document on measures to further strengthen uh, our response to human trafficking and slavery, which has been informed by measures contained in the draft modern slavery bill published by the Home Secretary on the 16th of December last year. Some proposals within the uh, consultation will touch on our work of implications for clauses in the human trafficking bill, and the Minister has agreed in principle with Lord Morrow that there may be scope for certain provisions to be incorporated into his bill rather than pages start at 256. So can I welcome Simon uh, Rogers, Deputy Director of Protection and Organised Crime Unit, uh, Julie Wilson, Head of Human Trafficking Team, and Alison Redmond, 
from that team as well within the Department of Justice. You're, you're all very welcome to the committee. Thank you. And as before, it'll be recorded and published. And I'll hand over to yourself, Simon, and then members will have some questions. OK, thank you very much. You um, <laughs> Mr Chairman, the Department's grateful for the opportunity to brief the committee on the Minister's plan to consult on proposals to further strengthen the response to human trafficking and slavery in Northern Ireland. Um, the document that you have before you builds on the Criminal Justice Act, Northern Ireland 2013, and takes account of Lord Morrow's bill. The consultation outlines additional proposals which we believe will help to reinforce and strengthen our stance against trafficking. And in summary, uh, we believe the measures we are proposing would simplify the existing legislative framework, strengthen the sentencing framework, uh, and I'll come back on a point in that in, in a moment where there's a revision to the paper that you've got before you. Uh, enable court ordered uh, restrictions to be placed on actions of those deemed to pose a risk. Enhance data collection and deliver um, with agreement a new UK wide commissioner to provide oversight focused on improving our effectiveness and sharing best practice. I think it's important to draw out a few uh, points. Uh, first, um, Officials briefed the committee in September on the Department's response to Lord Morrow's bill and, and signalled at that point that we were working with um, Home Office colleagues on a modern slavery bill and that we would keep the committee informed of developments. And today really is the, the culmination of that work. Um, uh, the final draft of that bill was confirmed in early December and so this is really the first opportunity we've had to share the proposals. And uh, as we'll probably discuss, timing on this is undoubtedly of the essence, and we are therefore grateful to the committee for accommodating us today. Um, the reason timing is so important is that we want to try and keep pace, if at all possible, with both the draft Modern Slavery Bill at Westminster, but also with Lord Morrow's Human Trafficking and Exploitation Bill. This is, for example, because the proposal for a UK-wide commissioner, if accepted, would best be included in the Westminster Bill with legislative consent here. But also, any of the additional provisions in the consultation, which are specific to our jurisdiction, ideally might be included in, in Lord Morrow's Bill to minimise as far as possible the number of bills on human trafficking. And, and as you mentioned, um, the Minister's been talking to Lord Morrow about that approach, uh, uh, which is agreed in principle. Um, the Home Secretary's Bill was published on 16 December. Um, the proposals we want to consult on take account of um, and reflect, to the most part, those measures. But we've actually um, worked with Home Office officials on developing their draft, but then have turned it in, uh, in a number of respects, into provisions which are specifically tailored to fit our um, existing and distinct criminal justice framework. And I, 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 with your permission, I'd just like to run through quickly what the, what the, what the legislation uh, would do. Consolidation of offences, which is one of the things that, that was discussed earlier. Um, we're seeking to simplify the existing legislation. At present, um, uh, Lord Morris Bell seeks to consolidate legislation into a, a single piece of legislation. Um, our proposals would go further by repealing um, existing offences of human trafficking which are currently defined by the type of exploitation and instead creating a single consolidated offence of human trafficking to cover any type. Um, given the links between trafficking and slavery uh, type offences, we would also propose to repeal the existing offence of slavery, servitude and forced or compulsory labour and create a new offence um, mirroring the existing one. Um, but what it would mean is that all the offences would be in one place and one piece of legislation. Um, the committee agreed with the Minister's view, which is now reflected in the 2013 Act, that human trafficking should be triable on indictment only. And we now propose to make the offence of slavery, servitude and forced or compulsory labour triable on an indictment only as well. And that differs with the approach <coughs> in Wales, uh, but it also has the added benefit here that it would enable the DPP, the Director of Public Prosecutions, to refer any cases to the Court of Appeal if he thought the sentence were unduly lenient. Um, we're also proposing to introduce a new preparatory offence in respect of slavery and trafficking, for example, aiding, abetting, counselling, etc. Uh, such offences already exist in Northern Ireland in respect of trafficking for sexual exploitation, but not more generally. 
for the slavery offences. And, and our approach goes further than the proposals in the Modern Slavery Bill, which only makes preparatory offences or brings in preparatory offences in relation to trafficking. Um, the paper covers sentencing in a number of respects. And regrettably, in one of those, I'm afraid, uh, we've spotted an error uh, which we correct before the document issues, and which I'll quickly explain. At present, the maximum sentence for human trafficking is 14 years. The draft modern slavery bill introduces an increase to that, uh, as was mentioned earlier, to life uh, from 14 years. Um, our document, as it stands, does not extend the sentence in that way. Um, when drafting the consultation, we believe that by applying the provisional provisions from the Criminal Justice Northern Ireland Order 2008, we would be enabling discretionary life sentences to apply. Uh, but we've now found that that is not the case. And uh, as our intention, therefore, was to have life as an option, the Minister has now concluded that life sh as, as, as the maximum uh, sentence should also apply in Northern Ireland. Um, in, in putting that in context, a life sentence here would be available, for example, in manslaughter, riot, spray, kidnapping and, and, and false imprisonment, for example, as a discretionary sentence. Um, we, we plan to amend the text of the consultation accordingly. Just to summarise on that point, the sentencing section would be altered so that the maximum sentence here is life, which is the same proposed for Great Britain and is the case already in the Republic of Ireland. Um, Finally, in sentencing, offences of human trafficking for sexual exploitation are listed in Schedule 1 of the 2008 order, which I mentioned. That means that the public protection regime um, can apply to those uh, sentences, and we would propose to add all forms of human trafficking and, indeed, the slavery offences to that schedule so that those public protection sentences would be available across the whole array. Um, the proposals also highlight civil orders, um, um, two new civil orders aimed at protecting the public uh, from harm by enhancing the powers of the court to restrict and regulate the activities of convicted uh, perpetrators. Uh, one order is a slavery and trafficking prevention order, uh, which would be aimed at those believed to pose a risk uh, because of their involvement in trafficking or slavery. Uh, there's also the slavery and trafficking um, risk order. Um, the orders would restrict the activities of those whom the courts consider to pose a risk. They're designed to protect against those who might commit human trafficking and slavery offences. There is or already a range of uh, civil prevention orders and statute in Northern Ireland, however, none of these is targeted at human trafficking or slavery, uh, and these new orders would cover that. It would fall to the court to determine whether any restriction was necessary to protect the public, and if so, what the restriction would be. Um, and the sort of thing we, we envisage here is uh, in respect of operating a certain type of business, working with children, um, operating as a gang master, as we've heard, or travelling to specific countries. Um, the Anti-Slavery Commissioner uh, is the other most significant factor uh, in the consultation. And we want to seek views on a proposal to extend the slavery commissioner in the modern, day, uh, sorry, the modern slavery bill to Northern Ireland. Um, you've already had some discussion around that matter in the context of Lord Morrow's bill. <coughs> and the minister's view is that Northern Ireland would actually benefit more from the insight and expertise of a UK-wide anti-slavery commissioner <coughs> uh, who would scrutinise and challenge the government and law enforcement responses across jurisdictions and who also, um, uh, importantly in a Northern Ireland context, um, would have oversight of all agencies, whether they're devolved or not. Um, and that, of course, is in the context of a crime type which does not recognise boundaries. Uh, the Northern Ireland rapporteur, which is proposed by Lord Morrow, um, would provide, in our view, for a more limited um, arrangement and would only have oversight of devolved bodies um, while others may wish to cooperate with such a body, there wouldn't be a statutory obligation on them to do so. While arguments can be made either way on this, the Minister believes that the UK-wide Commission would be more effective, would enhance capacity to learn from other jurisdictions and would provide greater value for money. As, as mentioned, the Minister has discussed this approach with Lord Morrow and he's open to it. Uh, indeed, he told the Assembly that a UK-wide Commissioner may bring a distinct advantage, uh, but... Uh, 
he wanted to see the colour of the Minister's money, so to speak, and this consultation does that. Um, I think one thing I should say about this is that what the Minister would like to avoid is having two commissioners um, rather than, uh, than one UK-wide or a local commissioner to avoid duplication and added cost. Um, finally, there's a proposal, um, and, and the earlier presentations demonstrate, I think, the value of this, to try and improve the capture of data. Um, there's a proposal for a new statutory duty on public sector first responders in Northern Ireland, so that would include, for example, police and, and health, to report all suspected cases of human tra trafficking to the UK Human Trafficking Centre. <coughs> Currently, while children who are suspected of being victims of trafficking would automatically be referred, um, adult potential victims are expect, uh, well, must first consent, and some adults may decline to be referred for a range of reasons. Uh, where someone declines a referral, clearly it impedes our ability to gather information about trafficking <coughs> and makes it more difficult to gauge uh, the true extent of the human trafficking problem. So the proposal would ensure that anonymised data on suspected cases of trafficking can be captured, which would help us to build that picture on the extent and scale. Um, in terms of legislating for the proposals, um, as we previously set out to the committee, and obviously subject to the outcome of the consultation, the Minister's preference is to legislate for the provision <coughs> locally. Um, that said, the proposal, for example, for a UK-wide anti-slavery commissioner, if, if, if agreed, uh, would cover both devolved and non-devolved jurisdictions, and, and in those circumstances, legislating through Westminster following a legislative consent motion here would be necessary, uh, which is why we are keen to keep step with Westminster's timetable. A few of the proposals, including those <coughs> to simplify and consolidate offences, would have a direct impact on Lord Morrow's bill. The other provisions would complement and reinforce it. Um, subject to the committee's views, therefore, we propose to consult for a period of 12 weeks, and, and as a result, uh, regrettably, as, as we've signposted already, we would not be in a position to bring any proposed additions or amendments to committee during committee stage. We would, of course, come back at the end of the consultation and I would certainly uh, plan to bring back provisions to the committee for consideration in early September on the timetable we're working to. Uh, with a view to tabling amendments at consideration stage. Separately, as you'll have seen from the letter received today, jointly from the Minister and Lord Morrow, uh, engagements continuing uh, between the Minister and Lord Morrow on the matters, and again, we would advise, will inv advise the Committee on any developments in that regard. We'd welcome obviously, the Committee's views on, on the document um, to take back to the Minister. Thank you. Okay. Mr Humphrey. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, <clears throat> can I ask, and thank you very much for your presentation, um, in relation to your um, consultation document that you've provided the uh, committee with, um, basically on um, page 7, you say, from evidence available to us, it appears the level of human trafficking slavery in Northern Ireland are lower than neighbouring jurisdictions. I have to say, um, I'm a bit confused about this because um, when you look at page 7, paragraph 2.7 2.8, your document says it's widely accepted that the actual number of victims will be higher than numbers provided. Um, you know, so quite clearly, and you heard what Neil Jarman said to this committee only some moments ago, uh, the problem is larger than the authorities are aware. How can you arrive at that, 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 that statement? Well, obviously, data is one of the critical factors that we look at uh, when we're, we're examining human trafficking, whether in the um, OCTF subgroup or, indeed, when we're, we're meeting our colleagues in, in the Republic or in, um, in the UK context. And therefore, we're aware of what figures they have, but we're also aware, because the UK Human Trafficking Centre runs um, other statistical analysis uh, where they write out, for example, to all police services, <coughs> to all NGOs and others saying, we know these figures aren't accurate. Can you tell us of any cases that you think we should be counting, which we aren't? And there are published figures on those um, in terms of the numbers that they don't think they're capturing, which should be in the system. Now, I don't think any, anyone involved in this work would argue that that is the true picture either. But what I'm trying to say to you is we, 
We are very conscious of the importance of data. We're trying to improve it. Indeed, one of the provisions in this is about data. Another angle of work we're undertaking is we've tasked uh, PSNI uh, research assistant, a researcher, to look at every single case uh, that the national referral mechanism holds on Northern Ireland to analyse <coughs> all the information in those to see whether we can bring that back to the subgroup and indeed to the um, engagement group, uh, which involves the not NGOs, to see if there's any of that material we can use. So that's a long-winded answer to your question, yeah. which says, from what we know, this is, this is accurate, but we're not claiming to know mm. all, all. But, but all given the nature of this of this business, uh, uh, which is you know becoming you know an industry across various sectors, um, I'm, I'm pleased that you've accepted that potentially the figures are higher than, than you would know because the data isn't yeah. there to substantiate what you've said. Um, Given the, the, the um, way you've looked at it in terms of Northern Ireland and the other jurisdictions, could it be an issue whereby police uh, in, in the mainland, for example, and various forces there uh, may have more statistics because they're putting more resource into this and dealing with it perhaps more robustly than police services here? Um, I don't think that's the case, but that is, that is a potential problem. Um, I think we are taking forward a huge amount of work around awareness and other things, but there's no doubt that if you have some of the very high-profile cases that have had in, in, for example, England and Wales, mm. public awareness accelerates uh, uh, and you have a, a, a greater opportunity or likelihood of reporting in, in those areas, potentially. Um, but we can only go with the figures we've got, uh, and, and the figures we have are giving that picture that, that we're putting there now. I wouldn't want them, and I hope they haven't shown that we look complacent in any way. That is far from the case, hence why we're here today. Um, it would have been easy for us to wait and see how the bill went in yeah. London, but we're, we're, that's not how we're operating. Sure. And, and to be fair, you've been honest to say that the data isn't there. Isn't it? Yeah. Just to accept that. With regard to the, if I may move on, with regard to the anti-slavery commissioner, um, you make a strong case in favour of the, the rupture across the UK rather than uh, on a regional level. I, Mr. Wells made reference there to, to the Lord Morrow and the Minister having reached some uh, agreements earlier. I, I know that Lord Morrow, for example, is, is not opposed to the UK Rapporteur um, rule covers covering the appropriate areas. But there are, to, to my attention, there are significant problems with the framework outlined in the National Rapporteur in terms of the, modern, uh, the draft modern slavery bill. Can I ask you, do you believe, uh, as, as a department, that the anti-slavery commissioner, is currently, as currently proposed, will be independent of government? Um, I think we're confident the person would be independent. We, we would certainly acknowledge your point about the bill being deficient at the minute. Mm. Uh, and the problem is uh, it's a sort of chicken and egg for us because we can't ask them to put into the bill the things we'd want before we confirm that is... Uh, what our consultation and, and this committee want. Uh, in other words, we would want a role in the appointment, so that, that would hopefully help answer the, the point you've just made. Secondly, obviously, we'd need to report to the Assembly, as well as Westminster, not, not exclusively Westminster, and, and, and naturally all the bodies that should be accountable to um, <coughs> provide information, etc., to the Commissioner would need to include our structures here mm. as well as, uh, as England and Wales. But the bill at the minute is deficient in terms of Northern Ireland and indeed Scotland, I think, because both those jurisdictions are taking soundings internally mm. before committing. You see, I, I ask that because um, in terms of Clause 30, um, the staffing uh, in terms of the anti-slavery commissioner is very much reliant on the decision of the Home Secretary. And the, for example, the Commissioner can only make reports to the Home Secretary on a, any permitted manner, um, which is defined as the Home Secretary. You know, what's your view on that? Does that not suggest that it could, could it be a criticism that perhaps it will only be as strong as the Home Secretary of, of a given day is prepared to let it be in terms of resource and, and how, how serious they take um, the, the, the reports or recommendations? Um, I think, firstly, uh, the Prime Minister is behind this bill, as well as the Home Secretary, so mm. um, they'll be, I, 
it would appear to me that they'd be keen to make it work effectively. Secondly, I don't think the model in, in this bill is so different from models that you'd see for other independent mm. functioning bodies. But, but to go back to my point, we would be making sure that if, we, if, if we're committing to this, that the arrangements are such that any concerns we would have would be reflected in the legislation. And that would include, for example, a role in the appointment and secondly, uh, consultation on significant things like uh, resources, etc. Because we would have to pay our share of, of any commissioner, whether it's a local one, uh, which we'd have to fund solely and wholly, <coughs> or a UK one, which we'd have to fund partly with Scotland if they ultimately sign up, which the, we suspect they will. Mm. And, and See, I, I mean, I've got to be honest, I, when you look at um, how successful uh, Mrs May's uh, <coughs> uh, plans were to uh, secure the, the borders and the ports, so the, the airports and the ports, um, I would be very concerned that uh, her department, and her in particular, would have some sort of, uh, in the role, uh, I don't want to personalise it because uh, it obviously states the Home Secretary, but she is the current Home Secretary and her record is not good on these issues. Um, in relation to um, the, the on page 35, uh, the department outlines why it uh, rejected the idea of a maximum life sentence. You, you've, you've, you, you've, you've clarified now that is now uh, you've accepted that. Yes. In line with the rest of the UK. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, in terms of. Uh, Additional changes uh, to the modern slavery bill during the passage of Westminster. Um, are there any, anything else you believe would be beneficial to Northern Ireland um, in terms of you know legislation that we brought forward here? And I'm, I'm thinking specifically about the fact that we have a land border with uh, the Republic of Ireland. I mean, I think on that we, we are in touch with our colleagues in. Department of Justice and, and Equality, and also the Garda Shikana are members of our OCTF subgroup. So I, I think we have a good we have good connections there. Mm. No legislation that they're, for example, taking forward in the Republic of Ireland that um, we're aware of, which we think we should be looking at. That's not to say next month or something they won't produce uh, uh, provisions, but uh, as it stands at the minute. Both, uh, we, we scan all jurisdictions to see what they're doing. Uh, and if there was something, we'd have it in here, because we haven't slavishly lifted the bill that the Home Secretary has produced. What we've done is actually to take it and say, what, what additions or alterations do we need for here? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether Julie is anything. I don't know whether, um, in particular, you were talking about things to address. Um, address trafficking on a cross-border basis, rather than actually to look at what's happening in uh, the Irish jurisdiction and, and see whether we can replicate it here. But in terms of what we're doing to to address well, the cross border, it's both of those things. Yeah. I mean, we we are in close contact with um, our colleagues in in DOJ, and we have we have um, collaborated with them on a number of of different projects, either to raise awareness or in, uh, sort of awareness campaigns. We also had a cross border uh, forum um, in October, and that was looking. On an all-Ireland basis, at how, how do you um, improve, how you uh, locate and identify victims, and identifying the problems that, that both jurisdictions are are facing, and and also identifying opportunities to work to, together to address those. It was looking at locating and identifying victims. It was also looking at how, on an all-Ireland basis, we look at, at demand and how do we begin to tackle those kind of things. So we have those. Um, we have those, that, that engagement in place. Um, Simon's mentioned um, and Garda Shikana as well. Um, so we have that kind of communication and information sharing in place as well, operationally through the OCTF uh, subgroup. So we are doing things. Um, we're also um, partnering with DOJ on um, uh, DOJ. You have had uh, received funding for uh, from the EU <coughs> to um, look at um, an awareness campaign. Uh, tackling human trafficking for sexual exploitation, specifically focusing at, at female victims. So we're working with them on that as well, although that's at very, very early stages. So mm. there are a number of things that we're doing to tackle the, the, you know, the cross-border element. Okay. Um, 
there, there's no reference to the, the just following on from that, there's no reference, you heard to what Frank said in relation to the Joseph Brown Tree Trust and to, in relation to the Gang Masters Licensing Act when, when he was questioned. Um, there's no reference to the Modern Slavery Bill or equivalent Northern Ireland covering fences that we were talking around in that, in that issue. Can you set out the Department's position in terms of the GLA offences um, in relation to your plans for consolidating slavery offences? Um, the GLA obviously falls under the um, Westminster Government rather yeah. than us, but has a jurisdiction here and, yes. uh, and would have close links to the OCTF. I mean, I've been at presentations I've made. In fact, they came they, in. They, but it's important, the reason it's important that there are no, there are no loopholes in, in legislation between the jurisdictions to, to allow you know, wrongdoing to continue. I, I think I would say there's no loopholes between the two jurisdictions. What I would say is there are a number of people who would suggest that the gang masters licensing authorities reach could extend further uh, and certainly we made <coughs> we did some research into the areas where <coughs> this might be relevant and, and Neil Jarman mentioned some of them around um, uh, fast food outlets um, I don't think he mentioned car washes but that, that's another one that we looked at mm -hmm. um, but uh, at present the GLA's jurisdiction doesn't extend there um, and, and certainly we have asked whether that would be possible. I'm, I'm not sure that the resources would be there to extend it, but from, from our perspective, if you're looking, uh, if you're asking other gaps, certainly we would welcome an extension. Whether I think it's realistic is, a, is another matter at the current Do you believe there are gaps? There are areas that it doesn't cover which we would like it to cover, yes. And you're confident that, that at the end of your 12-week consultation and when, when this is eventually debated and voted upon in the chamber, that you will have, you will have narrowed those gaps to the fact that they don't exist? No, because we don't have coverage on the GLA. Uh, mm -hmm. But what does happen is that the police, as a result, compensate in in their own um, work against trafficking. Ah, but you see, that that goes back to my point uh, earlier on when it, whenever the Bruce of Roundtree Foundation were here. If the resources are not deployed, <laughs> and given, for example, the terrorist <coughs> you know threat here, and, and which other uh, forces in the UK don't have to deal with to the same extent. And pressures on the PSNI, and then resources an issue where it you know, becomes <coughs> not not addressed. Because you see, you know, the vast bulk of these people are coming from other European states, and you know, we're talking about people that <coughs> have rights and protections. It's widely accepted that the actual number of victims of trauma will be higher than numbers provided. Um, you know, so. Quite clearly, and you heard what Neil Jarman said to this committee only some moments ago, uh, the problem is larger than the authorities are aware. How can you arrive at that, 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 that statement? Obviously, data is one of the critical factors that we look at uh, when we're, we're examining human trafficking, whether in the um, OCTF subgroup or indeed when we're, we're meeting our colleagues in, in the Republic or in... Um, in the UK context and therefore we're aware of what figures they have but we're also aware because the UK Human Trafficking Centre runs um, other statistical analysis uh, where they write out for example to all police services, <coughs> to all NGOs and others saying we know these figures aren't accurate can you tell us of any cases that you think we should be counting which we aren't and there are published figures on those um, in terms of the numbers that they don't think they're capturing, which should be in the system. Now, I don't think any, anyone involved in this work would argue that that is the true picture either. But what, what I'm trying to say to you is we, we are very conscious of the importance of data. We're trying to improve it. Indeed, one of the provisions in this is about data. Another angle of work we're undertaking is we've tasked a PSNI a research assistant, a researcher, to look at every single case uh, that the national referral mechanism holds on Northern Ireland to analyse <coughs> all the information in those to see whether we can bring that back to the subgroup and indeed to the um, engagement group, uh, which involves the not NGOs, to see if there's any of that material we can use. But so that's a long-winded answer to your question, yeah. which says, from what we know, this is, this is accurate, but we're not claiming to know... Mm. All, but but all given the nature of this of this business, uh, uh, which is you know coming you know an industry across various sectors, um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that you've accepted that potentially the figures are higher than, than you will know because the data isn't there to substantiate what you've said. Um, given the, the, the um, way you've looked at it in terms of Northern Ireland and the other jurisdictions, could it be an issue whereby police uh, in, in the mainland, for example, and various forces there, uh, may have more statistics because they're putting more resource into this and dealing with it perhaps more robustly than police services here? Um, I don't think that's the case, but that is, that is a potential problem. Um, I, I think we're taking forward a huge amount of work around awareness and other things, but there's no doubt that if you've some of the very high-profile cases that we've had in, in, for example, England and Wales, mm. public awareness accelerates uh, uh, and you have a, a greater opportunity or likelihood of reporting in, in those areas, potentially. Um, but we can only go with the figures we've got, uh, and, and the figures we have are giving that picture that, that we're putting there. Now, I wouldn't want them, and I hope they haven't shown that we look complacent in any way. This is far from the case, hence why we're here today. Um, it would have been easy for us to wait and see how the bill went in yeah. London, but we're, we're, that's not how we're operating. Sure. And, and to be fair, you've been honest to say that the data isn't there, so yeah. we'll accept that. With regard to the, if I may move on, with regard to the anti-slavery commissioner, um, you make a strong case in favour of the, the rupture across the UK, rather than uh, on a regional level. I, Mr. Wells made reference there to, to the Lord Morrow and the Minister having reached some uh, agreements earlier. I, I know that Lord Morrow, for example, is, is not opposed to the UK rapporteur um, rule covers covering the appropriate areas. But there are strong, to my attention, there are significant problems with the framework outlined in the National Rapporteur in terms of the modern, uh, the draft modern slavery bill. Can I ask you, do you believe, uh, as, as a department, that the anti-slavery commissioner, is currently, as currently proposed, will be independent of government? Um, I think we're confident the person would be independent. We, we would certainly acknowledge your point about the bill being deficient at the minute. Mm. Uh, and the problem is, uh, it's a sort of chicken and egg for us, because we can't ask them to put into the bill the things we'd want before we confirm that is uh, what our consultation and, and this committee want. Uh, in other words, we would want a role in the appointment, so that, that would hopefully help answer the, the point you've just made. Secondly, obviously, we'd need to report to the Assembly, as well as Westminster, not, not exclusively Westminster, and, and, and naturally all the bodies that should be accountable to um, <coughs> provide information, etc., to the Commissioner would need to include our structures here, mm. as well as, uh, as England and Wales. But the bill at the minute is deficient in terms of Northern Ireland and indeed Scotland, I think, because both those jurisdictions are taking soundings internally mm. before committing. You see, I, I ask that because um, in terms of Clause 30, um, the staffing uh, in terms of the anti-slavery commissioner is very much reliant on the decision of the Home Secretary. and. The, for example, the Commissioner can only make reports to the Home Secretary on a, any permitted manner, um, which is defined as the Home Secretary. You know, what's your view on that? Does that not suggest that it could, could it be a criticism that perhaps it will only be as strong as the Home Secretary of, of a given day is prepared to let it be in terms of resource and, and how, how serious they take um, the, the, the reports or recommendations? Um, I think, firstly, uh, the Prime Minister is behind this bill, as well as the Home Secretary, so um, they'll be, I, I, it would appear to me that they'd be keen to make it work effectively. Secondly, I don't think the model in, in this bill is so different from models that you'd see for other independent mm. functioning bodies. But, but to go back to my point, we would be making sure that if, we, if, if we're committing to this, that the arrangements are such that any concerns we would have would be reflected in the legislation, and that would include, for example, a role in the appointment, and secondly, uh, consultation on significant things like uh, resources, etc. Because we would have to pay our share of, of any commissioner, whether it's a local one, uh, which we'd have to fund solely and wholly, <coughs> or a UK one, which we'd have to fund partly with Scotland if they ultimately sign up, which the, we suspect they will. Mm. And, and See, I, I mean, I've got to be honest. I, when you look at um, how successful 
uh, Mrs May's uh, <coughs> uh, plans were to uh, secure the, the borders and the ports, so the, the airports and the ports. Um, I would be very concerned that uh, her department, and her in particular, would have some sort of, uh, in the role, uh, I don't want to personalise it because uh, it obviously states the Home Secretary, but she is the current Home Secretary and her record is not good on these issues. Um, in relation to um, the, the, on page 35, uh, the department outlines why it uh, rejected the idea of a maximum life sentence. You, you've, you've, you, you've, you've clarified now that is now, uh, you've accepted that? Yes. In line with the rest of the UK? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, additional changes uh, to the modern slavery bill during the passage of Westminster, um, are there any, anything else you believe would be beneficial to Northern Ireland um, in terms of you know legislation that we brought forward here? And I'm, I'm thinking specifically about the fact that we have a land border with uh, the Republic of Ireland. I mean, I think on that, we, we are in touch with our colleagues in the Department of Justice and, and Equality, and also the Garda Shikana are members of our OCTF subgroup, so I, I think we have, a good, we have good connections there. Mm. There's no legislation that they're, for example, taking forward in the Republic of Ireland that um, we're aware of, which we think we should be looking at. That's not to say next month or something they won't produce uh, uh, provisions, but uh, as it stands at the minute, both uh, we, we scan all jurisdictions to see what they're doing. Uh, and if there was something, we'd have it in here because we haven't slavishly lifted the bill that the Home Secretary has produced. What we've done is actually to take it and say what what additions or alterations do we need for here. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether Julie is anything. I don't know whether, um, in particular, you were talking about things to address. Um, address trafficking on a cross-border basis rather than actually to look at what's happening in uh, the Irish jurisdiction and, and see whether we can replicate it here. But in terms of what we're doing to, to address well, the cross-border... Well, it's bad things, both of those things. I mean, we, we are in close contact with um, our colleagues in, in DOJ and we have, we have um, collaborated with them on a number of, of different projects, either to raise awareness or in, uh, sort of awareness campaigns. We also had a cross-border... Uh, forum um, in October, and that was looking on an all-Ireland basis at how, how do you um, improve, how you uh, locate and identify victims, and identifying the problems that, that both jurisdictions are are facing, and and also identifying opportunities to work to, together to address those. So it was looking at locating and identifying victims. It was also looking at how, on an all-Ireland basis, we look at, at demand and how do we begin to tackle those kind of things. So we have those, um, we have those, that, that engagement in place. Um, Sam has mentioned um, and Garda Shikana as well. Um, so we have that kind of communication and information sharing in place as well, operationally through the OCTF uh, subgroup. So we are doing things. Um, we're also um, partnering with DOJ on um, uh, DOJ have had uh, received funding for uh, from the EU <coughs> to um, look at um, an awareness campaign uh, tackling human trafficking for sexual exploitation, specifically focusing at, at female victims. So we're working with them on that as well, although that's at very, very early stages. So mm. there are a number of things that we're doing to tackle the, the, you know, the cross-border element. Okay. Um, there, there's no reference to the, the just following on from that, there's no reference, you heard what Frank said in relation to the Joseph Brown Tree Trust and to, in relation to the Gang Masters Licensing Act when, when he was questioned. Um, there's no reference to the modern slavery bill or equivalent Northern Ireland covering offences that we were talking around in that, in that issue. Can you set out the department's position in terms of the GLA offences um, in relation to your plans for consolidating slavery offences? Um, the GLA obviously falls under the um, Westminster government rather yeah. than us, but has a jurisdiction here and, yes. and would have close links to the OCTF. I mean, I've been at presentations they've made. In fact, they came. They, they, but but it's the reason why it's important that there are no, there are no loopholes in, in legislation between the jurisdictions to, to allow you know, wrongdoing to continue. 
I think I would say there's no loopholes between the two jurisdictions. What I would say is there are a number of people who would suggest that the gang masters licensing authorities reach could extend further uh, and certainly we made <coughs> we did some research into the areas where <coughs> this might be relevant and, and Neil Jarman mentioned some of them around um, uh, fast food outlets um, I don't think he mentioned car washes but that, that's another one that we looked at mm -hmm. um, but at, at present the GLA's jurisdiction doesn't extend there um, and, and certainly we have asked whether that would be possible. I'm, I'm not sure that the resources would be there to extend it, but fr from our perspective, if you're looking, uh, if you're asking other gaps, certainly we would welcome an extension. Whether I think it's realistic is, a, is another matter at the current Do you believe there are gaps? There are areas that it doesn't cover which we would like it to cover, yes. And you're confident that, that at the end of your, your 12-week consultation and when, when this is eventually debated and voted upon in the Chamber, that you will have, you will have narrowed those gaps to the fact that they don't exist? No, because we don't have coverage on the GLA. Uh, mm -hmm. But what does happen is that the police, as a result, compensate in in their own um, work against trafficking. Ah, but you see, that that goes back to my point uh, earlier on when it, whenever the Joseph of Roundtree Foundation were here. If the resources are not deployed, <laughs> and given, for example, the terrorist <coughs> you know threat here, and, and the, which other uh, forces in the UK don't have to deal with to the same extent. And pressures on the PSNI, and then resources an issue where you know, becomes it's not not addressed because you see, you know, the vast bulk of these people are coming from other European states, and you know, we're talking about people that <coughs> have rights and protections, and you know, effectively, if you look, for example, at Turkey is not uh, you know allowed to become a member of the European Union because of uh, the, the, there are issues of human rights, particularly in relation to minorities within that nation, for example, the Kurds. But yet here we, here we have other European nationals traveling to other European countries within the European Union, and those protections aren't there. You know, so you know, there's a bit of an inconsistency there. That's my concern. And, I, and if, you know, I'd rather have legislation, quite frankly, than, than police, res police resource or lack of police resource being used on, on these issues. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I know it's difficult, and you've said that it's, it's hard for you to um, give figures and to quantify, you know, the, the extent of African and, and slavery. But um, can you give us some sense of what you think the proportion of slavery or forced um, labour? Might be which doesn't say it doesn't involve like trafficked victims. The only the only actual official figures that we have are captured through the National Referral Mechanism or the UK Human Trafficking Centre, their strategic baseline assessment. So and they are specifically linked to trafficking or um, you know potential victims of trafficking. So the the official figures that we have at this point, they all have a trafficking element to them. And of those, for example. Um, since the start of this business year, um, there have been 36 potential victims who have been recovered in Northern Ireland and referred into the NRM. So and of those, um, cover uh, nine of them uh, were um, in relation to forced labour. One was in relation to domestic servitude, which is obviously a subsection of, of forced labour. Um, 17 were in relation to sexual exploitation, and then the remainder of the other nine, the, uh, the exploitation type in those cases wasn't known, and that may be partly because of <coughs> the information that the, the, the victim felt they could give or couldn't give. Um, just don't know why the exploitation type isn't known in those cases. But so there is a significant number, you know, so 10 out of um, 36 that are known to have links with, with um, um, labour exploitation. Um, but beyond the trafficking scene, we, we, we simply don't have those figures at this stage. There's no mechanism on a, a national level that, that calculates that. So it's really just as, you know, any instances that different agencies might be aware of, but we, we haven't got those centrally anywhere. Okay. And do, do any of the law enforcement agencies um, take any action, like preemptive action, to investigate possibilities where, where you know, exploitation of this sort might be going on? 
in terms of labour, is there, would you be looking at it in that proactive kind of way? I think we've had instances um, where concerns about specific cases or specific uh, settings have been raised by members of the engagement group um, in that forum, um, and police have then followed up. Um, and I'm not aware of what has happened beyond that, but I know that concerns have been raised and they have then been followed and, and looked at, uh, into, but it's been handed over and the police have, have dealt with it. Um, and I think. Um, so sort of beyond that, I think you know there are areas that they you know, would watch because they may have concerns about it. Um, you know, so they're aware of the, the possibility of, of um, uh, links to trafficking or exploitation. So Simon has mentioned some of the areas where we would have some concerns around maybe car washes and things like that. So, um, but definitely within the context of the engagement group, concerns have been raised and then they've been followed up. But they've been about specific. Um, cases. Yeah, I, mean, I suppose there, there are concerns that um, I mean, often the PSNI don't follow diligently up on possible sources <coughs> of evidence in, in yeah. different types of crimes. So, um, the, you know, the fear would be that there would be no proactivity going on, and even where there are crimes, they're not diligently following up. So, the concern is that it's it's only going to be whenever serious cases come to light, just by their nature, that, that that's whenever um, it's, it's stumbled upon. And, and I mean, those are concerns. You know, I feel you know there should be a more proactive approach and in, in, in seeking out and following up on on <coughs> possible leads. We are not getting um, an avalanche of people saying to us the police aren't doing anything about human trafficking or when we make reports on a frequent basis nothing's ever done but but actually we're looking at the problem in a bigger sense of trying to take some of this out of the hands of the police so for example the, the, through the action plan we've got a section on awareness and we've done work around awareness training and it was a major event on Monday um, Belfast City Council and the CPLC and the DOJ ran where we had for example hoteliers, taxi drivers, um, people who might come into contact. So this is a, excuse civil service, but a multi-dimensional thing for us. It's not just in the hands of the police. We have responsibility. Health, social workers are out. They may see something. Um, and we're picking off these areas, you know, um, in a port. And so training for people in ports, prison staff, you, you know, we're picking off all these areas and, and, and trying to prioritise them and, and, and put training in and, and to raise awareness. Part of it as well is about demand and, for example, um, the research that we're running and, and is coming to a conclusion is looking at all these cases. So, so what it, it will do will say to us, um, for example, uh, we're finding these people are coming in because they're seeing adverts on a, on a website for the sake of argument. And that will give us a valuable tool to know that that's something we need to be more concerned about than we <coughs> were previously, and we need to be targeting it, maybe a particular website or websites. To, and that can modify our response, because what we know is the organised crime gangs keep, will keep moving, <coughs> so we can't stand still either. Um, but there are a number of factors. Yeah. Well, the, the other thing I would add is that Department of Employment and Learning have a role, and their enforcement yeah. team is um, represented on the OCTF subgroup. And I know they have changed the way that they operate. That, um, in terms, of, I mean, they've got a role in uh, in relation to um, regulation of recruitment agencies, and it was one of the things that Neil Jarman had mentioned. Um, and I think it does touch on that grey area of what is labour exploitation, what is forced labour and where do you draw the line between them, but they definitely have a role within that. And they have become much more proactive in, in sort of going to um, going going to towns, for example, just across Northern Ireland and, and um, rather than carrying out uh, formal you know, tell you in advance inspections, you know, they're, they're kind of more doing sort of hit and run sort of to see what, what information they can pick up. And they have links with the police in order to feed back any information or any concerns that they have. So in that sense, it is, again, multi-agency and, and, and there is proactive um, sort of looking for, for any con uh, issues of concern and, and sort of feeding those back. So there is I'm not saying that the, the structures are, are perfect, but there are structures there and people are... Um, taking the issue seriously, and they are, you know, 
looking to identify where, where there are issues of concern. I think in terms of the um, police specifically, they have developed and rolled out a training package for around, mm. I think it's 4,000 um, other officers, <coughs> and they've developed an operational field guide so that officers on the ground are more aware of the indicators of human trafficking. Um, aside from that, they do have, I think, as, as both Julie and Simon have said, um, good partnerships with the young Gordon Shikola, and there has been um, joint training between the two. You mentioned, one well, of you mentioned um, about ports, and when people are coming into the country, you know, and it's obviously trafficked victims will have mm. to come through some port or, or other. Are, are they asked for, say, information about what, what they're going to be doing? You know, are they going to be employed? And is that sort of thing followed up on? Because presumably, I mean, of course, people who are being trafficked won't won't have that information because they're, they're trying to come in under the radar. So, um, or being brought in under the radar, if they're if they're trafficked, they probably <coughs> don't have any control over it. So, would there be those kind of checks? I think those kind of checks would set with immigration. Um, and it is and part of their training. Yeah. And they are trained to look for signs such as the same story from ten different people coming through or, or, or whatever it is. So, yes, do people still get through? It must be. Um, but uh, there's many ways of bringing people in, I suppose. And some of the victims we're talking about are internal traffic victims, maybe from within Northern Ireland or indeed... Uh, United Kingdom or, or the Republic, it's much easier to move. Yeah, I mean, I think um, aside from kind of where people are coming in from other countries and uh, and and the immigration aspects and what immigration checks they would go through. I mean, I think there is a role for for us and our partners on the the OCTF subgroup and in the engagement group to uh, to be you know trying to increase awareness of just general staff who are working in, in ports and making sure I mean we've put our victims leaflets um, in those kind of areas as well and sort of points of transit points like railway stations and etc making sure that there is a, a much wider network of um, people who are informed um, and we're you know um, with the engagement group, we had gone through and we had identified the key sectors that we wanted to um, to engage with and to try to heighten awareness so that there would be more people who are equipped to spot suspicious signs and then to know what to do whenever they see them. So that's work that we've started and we are making good progress, but you know, we've done it on a priority sort of basis and we're kind of working our way through and seeing how we can build on it. There is one other important point here, which is you may, these victims may be coming here believing they've got a job, <coughs> so there isn't anything suspicious till they've got here, uh, and it's at that point that someone uh, intervenes and puts them into sexual exploits or labour exploitation. <coughs> so actually, when they come through, there aren't any signs because they're happy to be coming. There's no, there's no threatening person behind them holding a, a, a knife at their back. And yeah, but I suppose it is maybe that type of case also that I'm thinking about people who are fooled into thinking yeah. they're coming for a proper job and then they are coerced into whatever sort of exploitation and it's do you keep a record of people coming in the country and where they say they're going to be working or what's their contact details I mean I'm not sure is that something that, that happens those would be large yeah right? I don't know the border force would be able, would, would be able yeah. to keep keep all that level of detail um, but the, the research we're doing is looking at it from the other end about what, why did you come here and <coughs> what were they told and, and that might give us some lessons about about the pattern okay thank you um, last one in the here, here is mr wells yeah we have to go for seven so a bit of time yet <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've watched the choreography of the department over this last few months on this. You initially, the minister issued a letter, a scathing letter, basically binning the entire private members' bill. I note now, as a result of the letter sent to us, signed jointly by the minister and Lord Morrow, that there's been a bit of a Damascus rule expands, there's been a bit of a recanting and uh, pleading for forgiveness from the department, because basically, large parts of this bill you're now accepting. So, I mean, I think we all welcome a repentant sinner, uh, and, and that, that's good move, a good move, but, and there's a big but, you're saying in the letter that you still are not going to find agreement on Clause 6. Now, since we were last, you last before us, the committee has gone to Sweden. 
and we have spent a lot of time talking to the Swedish authorities. And I have to say the evidence was, in my opinion, compelling and overwhelming. And I'm a bit surprised that there's nothing in that letter to indicate that the department has done likewise, that, 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 that you have been to Sweden or you've discussed this with the authorities there or the minister's been. You know, given that that's such an obvious thing to do, what progress, if any, has been made since the last time you were before us? There's probably two or three things to mention there. One is, <coughs> I think there were a couple of assembly questions on that very point, and, and the answer <coughs> from the department and it's not trying to duck this, but it's not my particular bit of the department, but the answer, so I'm giving myself some cover in case I don't get 100% of this right, was to the effect that actually a lot of that material is available. You don't necessarily have to go to Sweden to pick up the research, the reports, etc. However, I, I do know that the Minister, uh, even I think he's, this week or something, yeah. was talking about the need to go to Sweden. Coupled with that is uh, progress is being made on the research project. Um, the niceties of these things are that you have to go through rightly through procurement and, and, and that has taken some time but I think by the end of the month we, that will be launched uh, uh, and um, the Minister undertook to, uh, to conduct research into this so that is now the point of, of hopefully being launched. I understand the Minister is about to write to the committee about the, the launch of the, um, the tender and exercise for the research um, but again like Simon it's another part of the department but that's my understanding of where it's at. Could I just say on that that the whole issue of clause six and the attitude of prostitution is very entrenched views amongst academics and therefore if you put it out to tender one academic would have a totally different view to that. It's not like doing statistical research at the end of it all you have to make a moral judgment. So you know it, it may be that whoever selected for this we will find, or maybe folk the other side will find, that their views are so well known that we can't put a great deal of reliability on the outcome of the research. So I just want to put that caveat <laughs> in as far as concerned. But I've been in this business for 32 years, right? And the one of the, and we've used, I've used this technique and many others have. One of the, 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 the longest traditions in politics is that if you don't like something, you put it off into the bushes and demand more research. That's a classic way of getting rid of something. And hopefully that Lord Moore will go away or we lose enthusiasm or there'll be a new mandate or whatever. So I remain extremely suspicious about this. We much, must have more research. Now, <coughs> that then leads to the situation, why has there seemed to have been such little progress made, given the fact you've been flagging this up for, for, for the best part of eight months, the need for more research? Well, I think we're at the tipping point now on it. Um, I, I think uh, Neil Jarman also said, you know, he wasn't going to comment on, on prostitution in the absence of research. I thought, uh, and that's what the minister's basically saying. I want to see what I can produce from the research. I no, think no, I don't like the bill. Therefore, I'm going to have research. That, that's that's what I believe is happening. But the I, research I is a tool to try and block it. Be not be honest about it. I, I don't think that's the case. But uh, I mean, that's. But, um, something for the Minister rather than me and, and, and secondly obviously with the letter I presume that the terms of reference <coughs> will be put to the committee to see so if you have a concern about the uh, uh, you know whether one academic is, <coughs> is more independent or uh, than another because of views that they express then, then that can be looked at. I think it's almost impossible to find an academic who doesn't have an entrenched view one way or the other on the subject. I've never seen something where the, the two sides are so diametrically oppo opposed to each other. And, and it is a very difficult moral issue, except, but I, you don't find too many neutral observers in this issue. I have to say that. So that's just 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 the warning uh, that you have. In the letter, uh, clearly progress has been made, and I appreciate that. There's been quite a bit of coming together between Lord Morrow and, and the minister, and that's going to make our life a lot easier. At that meeting and discussion, was actually close six discussed at all. Um, uh, it was discussed, and I think it would be fair to summarise it by saying they agreed to differ on, on, on Clause 6. Um, so there was no attempt to try and reach any sort of compromise on that, just the two sides were... Uh, I think there was an acceptance that, um, uh, that the Minister wanted to, to be informed by research, and rather than use the meeting to, um, to basically go over positions which were understood, and, and, and known and recognised, um, it was thought it was more constructive to focus on those areas where um, where we could see room to um, to resolve 
um, issues and, and concerns and to reach agreement. So it was really about um, uh, trying to press forward on those areas, and that's why there was an acceptance that um, the differences were, were too great to resolve on the on clause six. I could just say that um, I was obviously very much aware of the Swedish situation before we went, but I have to say that sitting down with the police and the director of public prosecutions and uh, social work staff gives you a far deeper understanding. There will be no criticism from this committee if you spend a day or two in Sweden in terms of the expense. It is money very well spent. And I have to say, I learned, and I have to say, I came back even more convinced of the nature of the Clause 6 than I left, and it's very seldom that happened. I heard absolutely nothing in that visit that didn't make me more convinced that we need to address this issue. And I think the Department are going to be in a weak position when it comes to consideration states if you haven't at least spent a day in Stockholm. Uh, and uh, that was my honest view. And I'm a bit disappointed that still you're telling me yeah. that you haven't been beyond Stormont on this issue. You still haven't gone out of the jurisdiction to find out more about it. We'll certainly feed that back to the team. Finally, we as a committee are going down to, to Dublin to, or to I presume that's confirmed. Terminal. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I hope I wasn't letting any out of the bag there. We're going down to Dublin to, to, to speak to our, our counterparts in the Republic. And what will happen if the Iraq Joint Committee on this issue goes down the route of introducing their equivalent of Clause 6 in the Republic? How on earth could we withstand? Uh, the problems that would cause that one part of the island of Ireland had the strong con controls and the other didn't. Uh, have you given any consideration that that situation could develop? I, uh, I mean, I'm not trying to avoid your question, but it's not, it, it, uh, and I should have commanded to answer that, but it's not, it's not our policy area. We're, we're, we're more specifically on human trafficking. The three of us, um, uh, and uh, if we thought we were going to move into that, we would have naturally brought the right people with us. Um, they are fully aware, however, that team of the uh, committee report and of the of, of the situation around it, in that it's a committee report at this stage, it hasn't progressed. But at the same time, I think the minister's view is that he wants the research to establish how he should view this situation. That doesn't mean he, he wouldn't support Clause 6 ultimately or would support it ultimately. It means he wants the evidence base. Uh, and, and that's the position he's brought to the Assembly and we've brought to this committee. Classic line. I need more evidence. Classic line. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, and um, obviously probably been, I've probably been slightly unfair in allowing some questions that you weren't necessarily here to deal with, but I uh, appreciate you answering them to the best that you could on those areas outside of this document. Um, obviously, we will have departmental officials to cover all of the areas. Um, I just, If you can take back, Simon, to me that whenever that does happen, um, we as a committee will have had all of the written evidence all of the oral evidence, and that will all be hand sorted. And what I don't want is departmental officials saying, well, we're waiting for research. I expect the evidence that this committee has gathered to be properly addressed by departmental officials. So I, I appreciate for the meeting of Lord Morrow and, and the Minister, they obviously decided, let's talk about areas that we can, can get agreement on. Um, and the Minister wanted more research, but I'll anticipate officials being able to address all of the issues that we will have to do with all of the evidence this committee has gathered. Not just the department <laughs> hasn't done this, so therefore can't really engage on it. But um, thank you very much, thank your you. team, for coming. Okay, members. Okay, Item eight, uh, again related to the human trafficking bill, and it's the evidence event um, that we're planning for the Long Gallery, and also then the, the programme for the visit to Dublin. Mm -hmm. Pages 391 to 399 of the, the meeting folder for the relevant papers. We agree a range of oral evidence sessions on the bill, and also this event to which other stakeholders could be invited, and that for members' benefit is on Thursday, the 13th of February, and it'll be from 12 o'clock noon until 3 p.m. Um, in the Lone Gallery, and it will then have a committee meeting. It will be a short one immediately after that meeting in this room, in room 30 on Thursday the 13th. So if you can put that in your diaries um, for that particular event. There is obviously in your meeting folder the groups that initially had been discussed. And I know Mr. Wells had uh, spoken to me. He had suggested European Women Lobby, which he wanted to be replaced with 
um, fees, because yes, I think yes, if you call Mr. them, if you, could. you contacted the, the committee um, actually recently as well. So um, you can take out the European Agreement Law, be unless other people want it kept in, but we we'll replace it with thieves. Ms. McCorley. Sorry, uh, Chair, just to, um, to clarify it, uh, I, I had thought whenever we, we were talking about inviting extra groups on, there was the original list supplied by the committee, or by, by yourselves, and uh, of people who we would invite for evidence. But I, I thought that we were actually going to invite more, more groups to the committee. Um, but are you saying now that all of those extra groups that we discussed that day are all just going to go into one single event rather than separately? That's what was agreed. The committee agreed, here are the, the groups that we were going to invite to come to this committee. Uh -huh. And we went through all of that. Then there was this second tier of other groups, and it was for the Long Gallery event that that was going to be the, the, the vehicle to use it. I, I had well, unless, unless I'm wrong. I had thought, because we talked about because it would increase the volume and, and put time pressures on, that we would then make them, you know, reduce to 30 minutes or limit them. And I thought in that context then we would be able to hear more evidence. And, and that's what I had picked up, yeah. rightly or wrongly. Well, it, well, we can check the minutes. I'm, I'm pretty certain the format that we agreed is the one that we followed, and that was we highlighted a list of organisations to have, as we've done today. Then there was this list of organisations that people wanted in to hear from. So in order to do that, we would have a long gallery event, which would be public <coughs> and, no, and, yeah. and recorded by Hansard. Yeah. No. Uh, I actually just thought that there was extra groups allowed to come to the committee to give, give evidence, and then the bigger event for uh, you know others as well. So I, maybe I picked it up wrong. But it will be recorded in the sense Antard will be recording it and it will be on the public record and it will be part of our committee report whenever we finish it all. So that was, I, I, unless I'm wrong, but the way it was left after that meeting was we highlighted here's the groups that we wanted to come to this committee for the evidence sessions as we've been hearing from and there's another one on the 30th of January where I think we've got five groups coming. Mm -hmm. and they'll all be here the way the other groups have already been. Then there were these other organisations that was maybe I'm being unfair to categorise them as tier two, but for example, in terms of the churches, there was the Catholic Church, the Presbyterian Church, Evangelical Alliance were all mentioned, and it was felt that they would come to a long gallery event rather than coming up to this committee. Now, that may very well have been the discussion. It may well have been the outworking of it. But I was the person who made the particular comment about inviting faith groups. I wasn't under the impression that I was inviting them to an event in the Long Gallery. I genuinely believe was they were coming to give evidence here. Well, I'm just. But I mean, I'm checking the minutes now, and this is this is the minutes, and this is the minutes that this committee subsequently agreed at the following committee meeting. The committee agreed eight oral evidence sessions with a range of organisations and individuals to be scheduled. The committee agreed arrangements should be made for the Department of Justice and the PSNI to give oral evidence. Then the committee agreed to hold an evidence event to which other key stakeholders that had provided written evidence would be invited. The format and arrangements for that event and organisation individuals to be invited would be finalised in January. So the format was agreed. The committee then ratified it at a subsequent meeting. Now that's. Do we have a list? Um, uh, really, Mary Mayton, would you have a list of the organisations who will be coming to the committee then in next sessions? Maybe it's not the 30th of Thank January. You. Is that? Is there only one more evidence <coughs> day left? Of that, of those, of the eight groups that we agreed here in this format, uh, it's all on the 30th of January. But then we have the Department of Justice and the PSNI who will come in this format. Then there was the long gallery event where there's the other groups. So that's the, the oral evidence sessions that were left. Um, to my recollection of, of that particular meeting was that you had identified uh, the, those groups, uh, 10 I think it was, that, that would come here for the oral sessions. A number of other groups were suggested on the day, mm. specifically suggested. 
and there was one or two when we started off with one or two we thought that was okay but then it got quite large <laughs> and I know or my understanding of the initial or the final decision then was broadly okay we'll go back to our original group that, that you had suggested uh, we would have the, the, the long gallery event but if there was people who were absolutely determined on, on some others then you would consider it I think that was the way it was left if there were one or two others that was, you know, people were, were very, very, felt very, very hard about and the committee agreed it, then, yeah, you know, we would consider it. I think that was generally the way I took it. I suppose the minutes reflect that, except it doesn't put that caveat in it at the end, but uh, that's certainly the way I looked at it, because I recall raising the issue of, of Clause 8, mm -hmm. and, and could we get specific group to talk on clause eight and I know it was touched on briefly today. Uh, but anyway, that's the way I felt that's my reading. Yeah. Sure. Just pretty much where where I am on it and, and there is one who has been contacting us again, wanting to come to the committee and it's a lady called Mia De Fita. Fita. Who has been contacting the committee behind the scenes for well, during last week, who was a victim of human trafficking, um, who was put into sexual slavery and, and she has been contacting the committee and that was something that um, she's been indicating the long gallery event she wouldn't be comfortable with and how we could manage that one um, would be would be an issue. The, the groups for the long gallery event that we had initially um, touched on was the Anti-Slavery International, Equality Now, Nexus, Evangelical Alliance, Northern Ireland Catholic Council on Social Affairs, the Presbyterian Church, the Rainbow Project, and Victim Support. Um, on Clause 8, it was the Law Centre for Northern Ireland and Horatia Chandron. Um, and who's the five coming to the committee? Are we um, in the five coming to the committee are uh, Space, um, which is Rachel Moran. Okay. Um, the Irish Congress of Trade Unions, Amnesty International, Dr. Hushka, Ugly Mugs, and Dr. Graham Ellison, and the Queen's the Queen's academics. Yes, the Queen's academics. I, I would be uh, um, my Irish is nil, but I'd be very keen with that lady with that name, Mia Falsha. De Falsha. De Falsha. Um, would be invited. Um, uh, um, is implicit what Mrs. McCauley is saying is that there's a group out there that that she feels should have been asked and wasn't. Is that? Nexus. Yeah, Nexus. Like, there come the long gallery event, yeah, but yeah. I mean, my sense was it would have been good to hear from them. Well, it would be inappropriate to, to, to win the pet Mrs. Falcher. Falcher. And, and, and that group has a possible addition. Well, it's, in terms of the long gallery event, it is a formal evidence session. Yeah. It will be formally recorded by Hansard. The only difference being there won't be cameras. But it will be properly recorded, verbatim, word for word, what everybody says. I think there's a major difference, Chair, though, that the groups that come here have quite a long they time to, to both present and take questions, whereas the long gallery, uh, you know, is, is a much shorter time. I think that's the difference. It is. Uh, and look, I have to say personally, I'm not keen to have all of the groups here because you'd never get through them all. Mm. But uh, if there was one or two in particular, and I think that that lady, I'm not trying to pronounce her name even, you know, that that would probably be a useful next, as I have no problem with either, because they're a service provider mm -hmm. uh, and, and work very closely with with victims groups, particularly women's groups, and, and I know that and have worked with them. So I have no difficulty with any of them if we can fit them in here. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, are you content with that long gallery event? Yeah. Um, I'm not going to volunteer to hold more evidence sessions. I'm not going to preclude members that if there's something said at that long gallery event that you feel you haven't got enough detail out, that you want a particular group, mm -hmm. that we can't try and fit them, sure. fit them in. Our, our difficulty, Mr. Uh, Mr Chairman, is that this lady won't be comfortable at the long gallery event. No, we'll accept that. So I think that, you know, if we're going to give her an opportunity, it has to be in this format rather than in front of a cast of hundreds. Yeah. Well, are members content with that? Well, OK, I mean, does she understand the difference between the four? Because at the end of it, it's not that different. And this is this is going to be televised, and it's not. Yeah. So she needs to understand that. Yeah. Is, is it maybe the case that she's actually asking to meet us in private? No, she's no. indicated that she is willing to come public. But I think it's because she'd be talking about very personal experiences. 
Hitmen, she would uh, need to understand that it's the television. She needs to understand there may be no less people in this room and that it's broadcast by comparison. Yeah, there might be more. And maybe, maybe it would be helpful just to give her the list of people who might be in the long gallery. Let her make her own decision. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Because right, you wouldn't want someone to arrive and then feel uncomfortable. No, absolutely no. not. OK, well, we can do that. We can yeah. give her the list and yeah. get her to ultimately take the final call yeah. if members but are happy, whatever calls. It's absolutely up to her. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. OK, thanks for that. So what about Nexus here? Are we doing? Do we have a Nexus? Mm -hmm. I would really hear what they're saying if we feel okay, that's fine. Them up, so Sorry, yeah. Well, yeah. Maybe come back to it. Yeah, I thought you could. Item 9 then, Section Offences Changes to Civil Prevention Order. <coughs> Oh yes, sorry, the, the um, Thursday 8am is whenever the transport's leaving here to mm -hmm. go to the Doyle for the joint committee meeting. So members that are going, if you can advise Christine of it, um, when someone <coughs> may get there. Thursday, the half eight spruce school, you sure. okay. <laughs> Am I in? So if you can let Christine know if you're able to go to it, then um, arrangements can obviously be made. Item 9. Pages 401 and 402 repaired. The Minister has written to advise uh, he's agreed clauses in Antisocial Behaviour Crime and Policing Bill to ensure that the proposed new civil preventive, uh, preventative orders, sexual harm prevention order and sexual risk order being introduced in England and Wales to manage the risk from sex offenders can also be enforced by courts here. Mm -hmm. In any case where an individual <coughs> who is subject to either of these orders comes to stay or reside, the Minister has indicated he has no plans to change the existing suite of civil orders for those convicted of sexual offences, uh, but he will re-examine the position at a later stage once the new orders pending in England and Wales have been implemented. So if members can note the position being adopted by the Minister. Um, item 10. Proposals for the reform of financial eligibility for civil and criminal legal aid. We had a meeting on the 5th of December when officials briefed the committee on the results of its consultation on reform of financial eligibility uh, for civil and criminal legal aid and proposals for statutory rules to harmonise financial eligibility test for applicants seeking civil legal aid and to introduce a new range of income and capital limits to be applied and a full range of allowances and disregards. Following the briefing, the committee agreed to defer consideration of the proposed statutory rules until early in the new year, um, and it's now for members' views to express as to whether they're content with the proposed rules. Mr McGuinness. Yes, uh, Chair, it's, essentially this is reduced to one element, uh, if I'm right uh, in my analysis. That's the introduction of a harmonised means test for civil legal aid. And the other, uh, the means testing for magistrates, of course, being deferred effectively, and the green form, the legal advice and assistance scheme, that's more or less deferred as well. But looking at, uh, I, I have no objection to harmonisation, incidentally. I think that that is a good thing. But given the uh, the the the. the uh, structure put in place, it means that there will be a reduction of people eligible to apply for legal aid from, and I estimate this, Chair, and my mathematics may, be, may, may not be quite precise, but I estimate it to be from reducing the current figure of 774,000, right, down to 630,000. So, that's a reduction of 144,000 people who would be effectively ineligible. It doesn't mean to say that if you're in the uh, 360,000 you'll get legal aid. It just means that th there would be eligibility. That's a lot of people. And uh, the, the, the savings here is uh, two, I think it's over 2 million, 2.4 million, something like that. It's not a very substantial amount of money. So that's uh, those are the points I would make in relation to this, yeah. uh, and mm -hmm. I, I can understand the idea of harmonisation. I'm not against harmonisation, and I think most people are f in favour of it. You know, I don't know if uh, the the aim is to introduce this sometime July of this year. May well be if uh, there's clarification sought in relation to that issue. Uh, the numbers of people affected and so forth. 
the savings seems to me to be fairly uh, small in comparison to the overall situation, which surprises me, in fact. Yeah. Mr McCartney? I mean, prior to Christmas when we were discussing this, and we met with Brent McGuigan from the Criminal Justice Inspectorate, and he was sort of you know, saying some of the work that he's doing, and he made, asked us if we had any suggestions, and one of them was the impact of legal aid, although he has no particular remit yes. over legal aid, but he said if he was invited, then it would be something to consider. And I think that's the type of thing that perhaps we're missing out on, is, you know, that there's swathes and changes. You know, I think most of us have been uh, asked to meet family law pra practitioners in particular, you know, which yes. seems to have, you know, it seems to be a, a concern about the impact on that. And it would be just interesting if we could get someone who has, a, if you like, a, an objective view just to give us the impact of many of these uh, changes. Yeah. So, so I uh, just raise those points, Chair, for the consideration of other colleagues. Yeah. Well, the, the Deputy Chairman had raised it um, before about that, and it would be something that I would be keen that we explore with Brendan and yes. the CJI to see would they be an appropriate body that could do a piece of independent work for us as a committee mm. to look at this um, and some of the changes that are being proposed. I'm happy for this particular one to be part of that. Yes. So if the, the committee is content, um, if the deputy chair and I meet with Brendan and talk to him about mm -hmm. the work that the committee has yep. been looking at, Certainly. and is this something that he could do, and, and get a, if he can suggest us this is the type of work that I can do, we mm -hmm. could bring that back to the committee and say this is what uh, the CGI could do for the committee. Is that something that we would want to, yes. to take up? There's some very positive changes, incidentally, that the department has introduced, you know, in relation to children, in relation to people, and so forth. I'm not uh, nitpicking with the department yeah. in relation. They've tried to do a, a decent piece of work. You know? Yeah. Okay. Well. Um, well, then we, we will leave that particular one and allow us to have a conversation with um, the CGI and see if they're able to do something for the committee. Item 11 is the forward work programme and uh, pages 527 down to 534. This is the forward work programme for court rules. The department has provided a, a brief outline of uh, likely, pro likely ones to be progressed between January and April of this year. At our meeting on the 2nd of June back in 2011, uh, we agreed the handling arrangement for court rules, which are concerned with procedural matters relating to the courts. And the department would provide a short synopsis of what each court rule would cover to enable the committee to decide on a case-by-case -case basis what consultation should take place in relation to each rule, as currently some of them are not subject to any assembly procedure. So it's whether members have any information in respect of what's being outlined for uh, the forward work programme for court rules that we want particular info on, otherwise then we'll note it. Okay. Noted. Item 12 is the Section 8 Guidance for Criminal Justice Organisations and Human Rights Standards edition uh, of the PSNI. This members will be familiar with um, in respect of the Attorney General's view uh, to uh, add the PSNI on the list of organisations to which his Section 8 Justice uh, Act applies. And, uh, he had been wanting to use the PSNI. We had obviously had correspondence from the Deputy Chief Constable from the Policing Board. We referred that back to the Attorney General, and he's now provided a response and indicated that he would be willing to meet the committee if um, we needed more information. I've spoken with my colleagues on the Policing Board, and it's Jonathan Craig who chairs the Performance Committee, which the Policing Board highlighted is responsible for doing this. Um, Jonathan has indicated to me that he would be content for this Section 8 guidance from the Attorney General. Um, he, he was of a view that you know, it would be taking away from the role of the policing board. Um, it's my view that it doesn't, and the Attorney General seems to make that point that this does not preclude the policing board from doing all of the work that it's already been doing, um, that this would actually add to it rather than take away. So on that basis, we're content um, that this would be allowed to proceed, but obviously the Attorney General uh, wants to make sure that there's consensus before that happens. So it's whether members feel having the Attorney General come in to talk to us would be helpful, or whether parties are able to indicate what their own view is at this stage. But I know internally we, we are now of a view that we're content for this to be brought forward. So do you want the Attorney General to come in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. please. OK. Well, We'll, we'll invite him in, and then, um, following that meeting, hopefully parties will be able to indicate what their, their own view is on it. 
Item 13 is an update and replacement of the Police Negotiating Board. And uh, at our meetings on the 28th of February uh, and 23rd of May in 2013, we noted information provided by the Department on the reform programme for managing police officers' terms and conditions and the decision by the Home Secretary to replace the current Police Negotiating Board with a Police Remuneration Review Body and the decision by the Minister to provide further opportunity for interested key policing stakeholders in Northern Ireland, including the Chief Constable, the Policing Board and the Staff Association Bodies, to express their views on the way forward that best met the needs of policing here. Uh, following the consultation, Minister has decided that it is in the best interest to have police officers' pay and pay-related matters handle, handled collectively in the new police remuneration review body. All of the respondents to the consult consultation believe that at least one board member with operational experience uh, from serving in Northern Ireland would help in understanding the issues from a Northern Ireland perspective, and the Department will work to ensure that at least one such member is appointed. The Minister is also of the view that the police pension provision should be retained in a standard form across the police service generally, and therefore he intends that pension discussions will be handled collectively for all ranks as part of the working group with England and Wales and possibly Scotland, with a view to reaching central agreements in this key area. He also accepts that pay-related matters for senior PSNI officers will transfer to the Senior Salaries Review Body, but senior officers' pension matters should continue to be dealt with collectively <coughs> through any UK-wide arrangements that evolve. And the reforms will take effect from September 2014. So, ways of committee are being asked to note the proposed new arrangements, um, and whether members have any other views or information that you need. Otherwise, we'll note it. Item 14 is the proposals to legislate for an offence of possession of extreme pornography. Um, at our meeting on the 20th of November last year, we considered a letter from the Department regarding proposals to legislate for an amended offence of possession of extreme pornography to ensure that uh, Northern Ireland would have the same levels of protections as England, Wales and Scotland. Two possible approaches to legislate for the change had been identified and the Minister had been seeking the Committee's views on the most appropriate method. First involved the Ministry of Justice extending the legislative change to include Northern Ireland if an LCM was approved by the Assembly, and the second involved making the change by an Assembly Bill, either with or without a period of public consultation. Uh, we agreed to request information on whether there was a suitable Assembly Bill to bring forward the proposed changes. Uh, within this current mandate and what the likely time scale would be. The Department has indicated that the most appropriate legislative vehicle uh, to make the proposed new offence would be the planned fines and enforcement bill that is currently due for introduction in the Assembly in October 2014. The use of this bill would allow for the proposed amendment to the law in England and Wales to have undergone its parliamentary process and to have reached its final date. So its members views on uh, the most appropriate vehicle for this to be taken forward on. Um, for my party's benefit, we are content to do it through this assembly, uh, using the fine and enforcement bills as the appropriate vehicle. Okay, yeah. In favour, okay with that. Yeah. Are the other parties content that we would do it through the assembly? Mm -hmm. um, Supportive of that, Mr. Chairman. I mean, it must be understood that the, the the level, the threshold that's set for this bill from Westminster is incredibly high. It's in, they're really stuff that's absolutely unimaginable, uh, and it might give us an opportunity just to look to see where we stand on this issue. Because uh, you know, there's other very difficult material out there which is unacceptable to the community, which isn't covered by this. So it might give us a chance to have a second look at this issue. Okay. We can do that, but. But we're, we're always of the view if you can do it here, we yeah, should do it. Yeah. Um, we take an LCM route where we don't have the appropriate opportunity, but I think on this occasion we, we do have. So um, we'll convey then the view of the committee that we would prefer it to be done through the Assembly. Okay. Item 15 is correspondence. There's four items, and um, let me draw attention to a couple of them. Item 2 is a response from the Department to the committee's request <coughs> for an update on PSNI support staff equal pay issues and the level of cooperation between the Minister of Justice and the Minister of Finance and Personnel on the matter. Um, so it's there for members' information. Um, I've been speaking with the Minister for Finance, who I understand, um, subsequent to this letter, uh, however not prompted by it, has been in now discussions with the Minister for Justice um, in relation to this specific issue and uh, to try and identify what areas can be taken forward. So, um, Chair, when would be the outcome of that? Discussion between the two ministers. I don't know. 
to know. So I think it's, uh, it's something we we would maybe be looking to see resolution sooner rather than there because it's been ongoing for a long, long time. Um, uh, Certainly, a number of making that you have very close end this on, on, on asking questions. Well, I think it's, it's so. something that we've been raising and obviously we can raise, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, the latest position has been the two ministers have had informal discussions and I think that's set to become more formal in the, the immediate future. So, But we will pursue it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, Item 4 is a copy of uh, the Memorandum of Understanding between the Office of Police Ombudsman and the PSNI, and that has been circulated separately to members. Um, again, both the Police Ombudsman and the PSNI agreed to share this document with the Committee on the basis that it would only be provided to Committee members and not circulated any wider. Item 1 of correspondence at the table packs, an invite from Roy Beggs, MLA, to a consultation briefing on scrap metal dealers in respect of his private members' bill, and that's on the 20th of January at half past 12 in room 30. And if you want to attend and advise the clerk, then please do so. Any other comments on the correspondence tabled? If not, we'll agree to action it as outlined. Um, I have no chairman's business. Any other business? No other business, then. Um, the next meeting will be Thursday, the 30th of January, at 2pm 2, 2 in room 30. Uh, next week will be the trip to Dublin.